I've put together approximately 35, maybe 37 video texts, and all the information comes from a book dictated to me by God as his righteous servant, a man described in Isaiah 53, and a man described in chapter 11 of Isaiah, the descendant of David, the twig from a shoot that grows out of the stump of Jesse, and it is a stump because of the banished and felled ancestral tree of the kings of Judah, the line of Jesus. He cannot be the man of chapter 11. He's not the anointed one. He's not son of David. None of that's true. The other book, that book is called Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord. And there's about three chapters in those particular videotapes um, that come from the second book that we wrote not too long ago. He dictated to me. It's the story of my life. It's to show you how I fit the verses of Isaiah 53, with regard primarily to uh, suffering, familiar with disease. So that would be wounding, wounded, and uh, as it turns out, cancer. But the other words that you find in Isaiah 53, um, punishment, maltreatment, crushing, bruising, chastisement, Okay, that is all in God's power. This is all in God's power, all those works. But <clears throat> the books are unpublished, you know, shunned and despised, the kind of afflicted uh, <clears throat> by God, plagued. Nobody understands. It. This is so different than the Judaism the Jewish people have been taught. This Messianic era that will never occur. And we know it's not going to occur now. Once you believe who I am and how you cannot. After the mountain of evidence I have presented that is in those books, just just as Moses today would have to say, well, look, you know, I wrote Leviticus. You think I just came up with that? You think I just came up with all this information? Did I know how God speaks through an angel and who that angel is? Moses walks by a burning bush that's not consumed. The angel of the Lord's in the bush and God speaks. I'm the one who explained that to you. I shouldn't have to go any further than that. The God says the rabbis, the shepherds, they never listen to my prophet. They think they know everything. Well, I don't keep showing that they don't. This is primarily for the people who listen to them and not them. I don't expect them to ever respond. Because by responding, they have to say they've been wrong. Or that's just not what we believe. And so they won't change. The bottom line is they make money on it. That's the bottom line. God had me watch a, a video of Toby Singer just for this one purpose I'm about to tell you. He said, watch him raise his hand. He raises his hand to do his hair or rub his nose or something. And it's this big, big, fat gold watch. And that's just how you know this is a God of old. He says, look at that. Look at that. I said, well, he does dive. You know, he skin dive, scuba dive. It might be a scuba watch. He says, that's no scuba watch. That's just a big, fat gold watch for everyone to see. And he makes his money on Isaiah 53. The guy said, at least that's how he really got going. I don't know. I know he has a radio show. But uh, it, remember, I'm in the fire refinement. Everything God does with me is to draw emotions because I'm going to be emotionless once I get to Israel, for the most part. He'll let me feel what he wants me to feel. But uh, and nobody can get under my skin. You can't bother me. Even if I seem like I'm mad, it, it doesn't carry over to my insides. And I don't, I don't think about it any more than while I'm, uh, you know, as they would say today, on a rant, getting on somebody. But, you know, I bring his reckoning. I laugh. I tell him, you know what I am, don't you go? He said, I know you're a lot of man. I said, no, I'm the reckoning. And I am the wreck. That's what I am. <laughs> he laughed. Holy Spirit laughed. 
That's what, yeah. I said, you know, righteous servant, uh, David the shepherd, Elijah, prophet like Moses. You know, I like wrath. What's his name? Wrath. What does he do? He brings a reckoning. But anyway, I'm, uh, I'm going to go through these early years of mine before God spoke to me. It's chapters 1 through 6. Chapter 7 is an eight, uh, God Speaks to an Atheist, and I've already videotaped that. Walking with God and uh, something on visions and visuals. So the, the first chapter, this is what he told me right now, right down, uh, Birth and Tragedy. I was born in Bryan College Station, Texas on February. <laughs> it's just then from the Holy Spirit, yes. Like you couldn't ask me before I spoke. Yes. Oh, this is only for the people who come to believe me. I don't expect anybody who's been viewing these materials and, you know, nobody's really subscribing a handful. Um, to, to be believed. Again, I can't imagine. I don't know what you people want. I don't know who you think is going to come to do something different. How are you going to know who David is? I mean, according to Judaism, there is no description of him. How are you going to know who he is? All this being presented, and I know Jewish people have seen it, only 60% of the views are coming from the United States. Now, I don't know that that means 40% is coming from Israel, probably not. You've got Canada, that should be a big follower on my WordPress site. And uh, it really, just all the countries of the world at one time or another have looked at some of this information as I wrote my blog, and the blogs became chapters. Um, but I'm assuming some Jews have heard of what some man is saying he is, let's see it. And they're watching. Well, this is for those who come to believe. The people who want to be the witnesses, the many made righteous. By my knowledge, by the things I can tell you that God would have me say to you. So, uh, you know, this might be bored to tears with others, but it does show suffering, pain, and uh, emotional pain, my background. And uh, just who I am, not just some kook out here. You know, you know. People say, "Well, he's hearing voices." Man, listen, as a lawyer, I didn't even do criminal law. I've seen some of these people who hear voices. I promise you, you know that's a person who should be hearing voices when you just see them and watch them for a couple of minutes. That's not me. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I was born in Bryan College Station, Texas, on February 21st, 1957. And that's interesting because that's the year the first satellite went up. Russia sent up Sputnik, which was really three different satellites, and all together they were called Sputnik. Uh, that is considered the dawning of the age of the Internet. Now, I've asked God, how did you select me? How did I be, be blessed with this? and learning all these things with this crazy life that I've had. And, uh, but he won't answer me. He, he, <laughs> he's gone poker. This poker guy, he's not going to talk. He's not going to change expression or anything. Or me getting an impression that he is. Uh, and, and so I've tried to come up with it on my own, and that is where I started. I said, because I know how important the Internet is to this. It's the only way to get things worldwide then. And, and all the teachings that have been have come through it. Uh, I didn't know, you know, I'm 63. Uh, I'm not like the young people who can just text messages without looking at, you know, looking at them. Huh? And all that. But he's taught me everything. He taught me how to set up Facebook, Twitter, uh, you name it. And uh, he would just say, go to your computer, do this, do that. You know, commanded it and directed to become very good. Uh, at the computer and, of course, word processing. You know, I'm a regular uh, secretary, except I still hem pick with one finger. <laughs> I used to. But, uh, God said, that's to show you, I have perfect use of this uh, this figure drive on. It just doesn't have muscle in it, and my shoulder show you. Anyway, I was born in Bryan College, and that's what Texas a and University is. And uh, that my dad was attending Texas A&M when I was born. Um, 
I gradu graduated from there 22 years later, which is a story in and of itself. So I was born premature in the seventh month of my mom's pregnancy. I was born in February, and there were many complications. My parents were told I would not make it through the night, and they should just take me home. Mind you, this is 63 years ago. The biggest problem was that my insides had not fully formed and it was impossible for me to take milk. Mammy, my great-grandmother, told my parents, boil rice, feed him the rice water, set all kinds of nutrients and minerals in it. Dad says he threw out a mountain of rice those first few months, and it would not be my last encounter with death. So my dad graduated, and we moved to Metairie, Louisiana, uh, and his first job as an oil and gas geologist. He looks for oil and tries to sell deals to people who can raise money to drill. He gets money up front, the percentage of production once they get their money back. That's what he's done his whole life. And I became, as a lawyer, as a lawyer, I became board certified specialist in oil, gas, and mineral law because I had found it so interesting. He just, as a young boy, I became interested. But he rarely had time for us. The other part, I said, okay, well, I was born with the dawning of the internet, so he's got a selection process for 57. And I come from a dysfunctional family. Lots of drinkers, lots of fighters. And on my mom, my mom, her grandfather committed suicide. I'm looking at this, it's tragedy. Earth and tragedy, tragedy. Um, in the Great Depression, he lost everything. He owned land in what is now downtown Dallas. But um, but then when she was about four or five, her mother went down to the Market Square in Crockett, Texas, small East Texas town. Everybody has their courthouse in the center of town, and there's streets on either side with stores. She went to the hardware store and purchased wreck poison. She hadn't gotten hardly out the door when she opened it and took it herself died right there on Main Street in the middle of the day in a little small town. I don't know how long that would have been. My mom's 85 or 6, uh, she was 4 or 5, you know, almost 80 years ago. So um, I'm sure it was quite an event. And her dad uh, took her and her sister, her sister's about two years older, to uh, met her and uh, not Metairie, to uh, some place in Louisiana, but uh, could have been Baton Rouge. And uh, her father became a elevator operator. And you can still find this in Houston when I was at law school. I went to law school downtown Houston, mm -hmm. but uh, South Texas College of Law. And At the courthouse, they, they would have somebody sitting in there on a little stool and with a lever and take you up or down, take everybody up or down. You know, with all the lawyers coming in for the court cases, it was packed. Um, I'm, I'm sure they've done away with it by now. But that's what he did. And uh, they found him one day or night. Uh, he had taken out a pistol and shot himself in the head and killed himself. So now she had suicides on both sides of the family. And uh, her father's brother took a, took the two girls in. He actually adopted them. And uh, and she was about 10 or so, I believe. Uh, she's with him out in some shack in East Texas. And, uh, you know, there's not even phone in this place. And he took a shotgun. And I'm sure he'd been drinking there all known for it. And uh, blew his head off right in front of him. I mean, that's all the circumstances I know about. It doesn't sound like a good scene at all, but it scarred her for life. Okay, we've been taking care of her from the get-go. My father amazes me to no end. What, what he has done to, to care for her. See, they knew he, that, that, they, that was his sweetheart, eventually, now at 10 years old. That's who he married. And they're both from Crockett, Texas, small town people. I still take care of them. They've taken care of me for 10 years. <laughs> Got to me from society. He made me quit law. 
terminate my law license in Hawaii and Texas and uh, took me into poverty. I've been in poverty for 13 years until I just now filed for Social Security early. Uh, but I give them more than 90% of it to, to make up for everything they've given me for 10 years, 13 years. Uh, while I'm in God's fire of refinement, learning everything I need to know. And I have learned much. There ain't any question. So anyway, there's three suicides. There's four suicides right there. So it's a family of tragedy. You know, it's a, a tragedy of losing your entire family in the Holocaust, and you're the only one left. It's not like that. But as God says, I just got things as close as I could. He says, I touched you in the womb to just feed you, really for just one reason. Well, two reasons. One, it makes you identifiable, but it was so people would pick on you. I wanted people picking on you because that's what happens to young Jewish boys. Just for being Jewish, just for having a disfigurement, people will pick on you. I told him since, I don't even really recall many people saying anything to me. He said, that's because you look like you crawl all over them. <laughs> they did. And I did. I, always, I was always, just say something, anything. It's just the way I, I was just angry inside. And God's taken all that away. <clears throat> but I can still go on a good rant. But, um, and then my mother in the 60s, uh, young people may not know this, but that, that's when, you know, the Woodstock and marijuana, LSD, everything started getting big. And at the same time, doctors were just handing out pills, let's say, uh, Valiums, painkillers, Percocets, you know, just asking for it. They were writing scripts. And I know today they put a lockdown on that. But uh, she got heavy into it and drunk all the time. I had to come from school and stay with her. And, um, and she became such a different animal, a different person when she drank. She became a little girl. You know, and having your mom act like that and slobbering and, you know, going there to be valiant, dripping out of her mouth with a bottle of booze by her. So it was an ugly scene. And, uh, so I came from a dysfunctional family, so I think God, and God wanted that. And he's there with me from my first year to make sure that I live a life of suffering. He orchestrated many of my ones, and he's taken me back in vision to see these things. And his vision is that one thing you don't pick up in, in, in the Bible. When I say Bible, I'm talking about the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible, but it's not, um, unless I say otherwise. Which is like when God says, my peoples. If he just says, my peoples, he's talking about the Jewish people, the chosen. I mean, he may say, uh, uh, the peoples of Moab, uh, or just by the context, you know, he's referring to another group. But that, that, uh, that comes up all the time. So, uh, to add to that, she tried to kill herself a few times. And when I was 10, my dad was at a Texas A&M game in Dallas. And I know it was 1967, so I was 10 years old. Because I'm very familiar with that particular game. It was against Bear Bryant and Alabama Crimson Tide. And he had coached at Texas A&M. So, uh, as you can tell, me and my dad are big uh, Aggie fans and football fans. But... <laughs> <laughs> I had been assured we'd be able to see those games in Israel. Somehow, I might have checked them. He said, we'll get it. That's the Holy Spirit. We'll get it. I said, he's so funny. Um, I don't know where my sister and brother were, but um, I heard some noise, and I went down it was about 1 or 2 in the morning, and uh, our stairs curved. And it was a bay, little bay window cut out. And I looked down out into the living room. She's laying newspapers out. And I just sat there watching. I didn't know what to do. And uh, she got down that paper and took out a butcher knife. Not a razor blade, a butcher knife. And opened her wrist up. And uh, this happened again years later when I was in high school. She opened her elbow up. And that was god awful. I don't know. But, but, but before she bled out, my dad opened that door. I sometimes think she knew he was going to be there soon, would probably save her. But it didn't look good. And I hated myself for not doing something. Maybe that's why I was so angry. Anyway, um, because I didn't do anything, I just sat there. 
I couldn't move. I don't know. I don't even know what I was really thinking, really. But um, I can't. It, what it did is it told me how much her uh, uncle, blowing his head off, must have done to her. That that must have it really hit you. <clears throat> I had nightmares my whole life, but. Um, I was 16 when she did the thing with the knife. Uh, but you know what? My dad finally got her to, he got her the best psychiatric care in Houston, Texas. And that's big because we got a medical center that's renowned throughout the world. And they, they put me back together many a time. And uh, she never did that again. And the amazing thing is, is how different she is in her very advanced old age. I mean, it's like she was never that person of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. I didn't know how my dad survived it. I'd have never stayed. I'd have taken the kids and said, try to find us. But uh, he's not out there. I've never seen two people who love each other so much. <laughs> it's just, it's crazy. <clears throat> but anyway, I was married for 20 years and we weren't like that at all. We finally divorced for irreconcilable differences. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, my first major surgery is when I was two years old. My first surgery. Up above here, I have a scar. I had my first of many surgeries. Been born without my right, right pectoral muscle. Small shoulder, withered arm. And there was some, my, my, the movement of my arm was restricted. There was some tissue in here that had to be cut out. So they opened me up and did that. I was born right-handed, but I, I do everything left-handed. Uh, except for light things, like I shoot a basketball right-handed, uh, I throw a ball right-handed, darts, things like that, but bowling, I'm left-handed, you know, anything heavy. And uh, I was I was quite an athlete. If I had two good arms, I, I'd have probably been on scholarship. I, I was already offered a partial scholarship at a small school for track, even with this bad arm, but you just, you, you, you just, I just didn't have the fast start. You gotta have two strong arms just pushing out in front of you. But I was some kind of quick and fast. So, um, we moved back to Houston to a place called West University, a suburb. And uh, <laughs> this little story, I don't even like telling it, but God tells me I have to. And uh, he had something to do with it. But I'm not going to go into that part of it. Uh, so anyway, I decided when I was in second grade, I was tired of school, didn't want to go anymore. I don't exactly know why, I just know I said, that's it, and I'm not going. Dad came to me, get me up and take me to school, I told him I'm not And it was on. He was going to get me there. He took him about an hour to get me to the car. Fighting and screaming and running around and hiding and getting under me. <laughs> you name it, I was doing it. And uh, but anyway, he finally gets me to the school, but uh, he's too tired. He wasn't even going to try to get me out of the car by himself. So he get out, and he goes and gets the principal. And my dad's about 6'2", but he's real slim. And, uh, but he comes out with his principal, who's taller than he is, and he's a hefty guy. He's burly. Anyway, so they come, they said, get out of the car. I said, I'm not getting out of the car. <laughs> I'd already locked the doors. Not only the two front doors locked, and it was those locks that you pull up and push down. And so uh, my dad used the key, and he opened up, he popped that lock up, and I slammed it back down. He said, I'm not going to school, I told you. <laughs> he threw some keys, they started throwing the keys at one another over the roof. And principal was trying the same thing, and I'm slamming his door, I'm leaping across the car. Man, I don't know how long I went, but they finally, you know, five minutes maybe, seemed like an eternity. I was terrorized. That's the way I look at it. Anyway, the principal got it open, and I saw that door open, and I, I got back on the first other side of it, behind the, by the steering wheel with my back against the, that door, and I curled up like a ball, had my, my knees on my chest. And he reached in <laughs> to get me, and I unleashed on him, kicking him in the face with everything I had. He broke his glasses, and his orbital bone got shattered. So, you know, 
That wasn't my first friend's way either. There's another one. So, uh, but anyway, so they carried me in, and it was very embarrassing. He was crying. But again, funny thing, nobody, because I stayed with this same group for nine years, going to West University and, and, and the junior high there that you go to. Uh, nobody ever said anything to me about it. And I knew some of those kids I, that were in that class. My camera only goes for half an hour. It's, I can see on the screen that I have point towards me that when it runs out, I have to turn it off and turn it back on. But uh, but anyway, um, that ended uh, my fight with the, my first principal. Yeah, here it is right here. I just got heavy put these together. In the 10th grade, the principal of the school told me to cut my hair. You know, I had long, blonde, wavy hair, well past my shoulder. Again, this was, you know, I graduated high school in 76, and uh, this has been junior high, so it's in the early 70s, but it felt like the 60s still. And you know, I kept in a ponytail. It was neat. It was a school-wide policy. I think I was one of the last people to cut his hair. I was hiding all the time. <laughs> I was always on the alert for the teachers that would turn you in. But um, I went and got it cut. I told the barber right at my collar. Sat there in the chair, cut it right at my collar as I was instructed to do. And then I was commanded to return to the principal's office. And um, so I... Presented myself to him, I sat down in the chair in his office, and he gets up, walks behind me, and grabbed me by my hair, back of my head, and jerked my head back fast. And said, it's still over your collar. Now, I don't know if I did a backflip out of that thing. I can't really recall. But what I do recall is it took three people to get me off of him. And I was permanently expelled from school. Which ended up me leaving home. It wasn't a runaway. I'm just out of here. I'm tired of everything and everybody. I ain't going to school ever again. Hate school always there. That was me. And they had to pull me off of him. I understand through a friend of mine. He said, you know, my brother went to that school. He has some stories about that guy. So I said, it wasn't me. It's him. Uh, second major surgery came when I was 12 years old to try and repair my right knee and just below it. I was running full speed in a field. Uh, high grass and weeds uh, with a family dog. And God says he had something to do with what the dog did. Uh, for no apparent reason, just suddenly he was running at my side. And he just bolted, he just shot going straight to the heart of the left and went right between the legs. I go sailing in the air and I came down on my knees. Except my right knee came down on a broken Coke bottle, Coca-Cola. And they used some thick grass back then. It was stuck nose down, way down. It was all broken up, but uh, it was the, the bottom all jagged that my knee just... You know, they said it went to the other side of your knee. They said, you got that whole field in your knee. But uh, when I got to the hospital, I sat there for a long time. The first doctor came in and just told my mom, right in front of me, you know, I'm in the room, you know. He said, I can't, I can't repair that. It's not repairable. We want to take it off. He can't use it. And I already knew that because when... As I started screaming and yelling for my dad, he finally came back. This field was behind our house. There was a chain leak fence and then the field. Um, and, you know, my dad finally heard me. He got over, he saw the blood, and so all of a sudden he scared to death. I'm going into the shop. And uh, he got me to put my arm around his neck. And he said, can you walk on it? And I tried and it just collapsed. It was useless, it was, you know, it was awful. And then I had to climb over that fence and my mom was going crazy and screaming and crying. 
And he had to go take care of her. I'm sitting in his bathroom with my leg all opened up and I'm just getting sicker and sicker. Nauseating, scared, I was, I was a cripple. And uh, but anyway, they get me down to the hospital. And this, like I said, the first doctor was just like, we don't know what to do. And just right then, and God says he knew he was going to be there. This doctor walks by, and my mom recognizes me. And she goes, Dr. Kane. And she runs out the, out the door. Well, that's easy. Dr. Kane, her mammy that I mentioned earlier, uh, in her uh, old age, very old, maybe in her 90s, I don't know, late 80s, but uh, living with uh, her sister, uh, broke her hip. And this doctor repaired it. This is a long time ago, people. Repaired it, and she actually walked again with a walker. I remember. But uh, that's who this doctor was. And she said, my son, my son, they're going to take his leg out. You've got to come look at it. And th this Dr. Kane actually became uh, the medical doctor for the Houston Oilers. He repaired many in me before, before and after me. Um, I guess that's what he specialized in. But he was there at the hospital just to do rounds. He wouldn't dress for surgery or anything. And But he came in that room, and I mean, he was livid when he looked at my knee and knew how I'd been there for like five hours at this time. And he was, he just started barking orders about getting me prepped for surgery, and he takes off to go get prepped. And they literally ran me down to surgery in the gun. I mean, they were trying. He <laughs> just kind of feared he put in everybody. Anyway, I was in the hospital for weeks, and I woke up with a, with my leg. I was glad of that. But I had a cast from my hip to my ankle. And uh, he told me, when, when I finally was being released, he said, if you put any weight on that leg, you'll never walk again. So, uh, I can't remember, six weeks. I don't know how long it was that I had that cast on it wasn't my first case, it wasn't my last. Uh, well, maybe it was my first, maybe it wasn't my last. <clears throat> That's another story. I'm not going, we're not getting very far. Uh, there's six chapters, I'm barely getting through the first one. But uh, what I'll do is I'll just do six, just like I did with Isaiah 53. I did uh, six or seven videos, seven I think. But then I, I joined them all together and put it as one video, the definitive commentary of Isaiah 53, which comes straight from God, by the way. I mean, you can contest what I'm saying all you want, but it makes perfect sense for the first time Isaiah 53 is explained. Now, how did I become the smartest religious Jew in the world who can see that and, and what the wounding and the punishment, everything's about and how it's, it's really, in some ways, uh, a snare for the Gentiles for the day of the Lord? Because he knows he can take me and just decimate any argument they want to put forth. You know, in particular, I'm blemished. I am not, I, I, I'm the answer to Christ. In that, I am the exact opposite of Jesus Christ. Like, uh, he's so smart, he was teaching synagogue at 12. Supposedly he was a perfect, beautiful man. I'm disfigured. Now, I'm not bad looking, but I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, uh, Brad Pitt or anything. Anyway, um, and sinner, you know, uh, I was <laughs> I told God, well, what a habitual sinner. I, mean, I was a good person. I was good to other people. I was very compassionate. Um, I said there was already a lot of humble in me. I didn't laud myself and the things I could do over others. You know, like being the fastest guy at school, on top five at school and the fastest in the neighborhood, you know. I didn't brag on myself, but uh, as he took me back through my life I, <laughs> and informed me when things were sin, it, it just seems like I touched on all of it. And if murder in your heart is actually committing that sin, as a Christian say, so I, I don't, I don't really go with that. But then there's really not much I've missed. <laughs> so I'm a sinner, and, you know, Jesus, all Jesus can say is, well, I'm a sinner too, I'm lying. All you got to do is read the scripture in the Gospels, you see where I'm lying. That's easy, and I came from the banished line. I thought I was the man of Isaiah 53. I thought I was going to be exposed to death, <clears throat> but given a long life. This is what he would tell you if he was here. He said, but well, you know what happened? 
They crucified me. And on the cross, I realized I'm not that man. This is an exposure to the dead. This looks like a sheer thing. Father, 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 why have you forsaken me? That's Jesus Christ saying, I'm not the man of Isaiah 53, and I just figured it out. That's what that is. I ask God sometimes, you sure you didn't have that written? Why on earth will they write that down? And they forget about it. We need to just think of me. That's what it's about, Christian. They, oh, they got their way. To, they can explain that being counted a sinner means he, he, he got crucified with a, with a sinner beside him being crucified on each side, left and right. So there's three of them, so he's counted a sinner. Okay. You know, it's supposed to be discreet, but hopefully it'll find a person to you. It might help. You might tell Judaism the same thing. You know, this is to find somebody. It's not the people of Israel. They, they're all kinds of people. Now, we're looking for a guy so God can have a Moses. Why? We have a new covenant. Why? It's the day of the Lord. Why? Jeremiah says so. That's why. It's so easy. The land blows again. Okay, and he's coming with a friendship with the temple. So the land blooms again at a time when there's no temple. Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. It's a metropolitan today. This is no Jerusalem of antiquity. The old city might be, old city might be too big. And I'll make a new covenant with you. I'm going to forgive all your sins and remember them no more. That will cause Torah to be written on your heart. It's a metaphor. When did he, that's like, huh, when did he do this before? Oh, that's right. Assyrian Babylon exiles, Isaiah was right before. God said, I forgive your sins, remember them no more. They became a holy seed, what they did? They built the second temple. What are we missing? <laughs> the third temple. This is so easy. So it is the day of the Lord. There ain't any question of that. I'm just telling you, it started with the Russians. Said that I spot me, hello, Rusty. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he's bringing the covenant, but he's got to have a Moses. He said, I'm sent a prophet like Moses. So he's saying, it's Joshua. No, it's not. Come to him today, the day of the Lord. And guess what? He gives us a description of him. He knows this is a time of secularism, reliance on science and medicine and doctors. And you got so many more people who the only book out there is not the Hebrew Bible. There's a lot more books than that. You know, there's all kinds of distractions, television, cell phones, computers. You know, back then, you know, you just sat around and said, what do you think that's that? I don't know. Wish he'd send some rain. You know, it was just... I said, it's easier to get them back then. But um, here it is. It's here. And I said, and God said, you see why I put Shun and Despise in there? Because for a while, I said, God, you know, this is before we really got the books done and everything. I said, I'm just sitting in a room. I can't really tell anybody Shun and Despise in there. Counting me plagued, afflicted. My God, everything else. He said, well, how you feel now that we've been putting all this on the internet? I said, I feel shown in the spine. Yeah. I can tell they know. There's no question this hasn't gotten back to those two. I said, you keep attacking them like this, and I'll be certainly sure, just in case I'm wrong. But, because uh, he won't actually tell me. I, he won't tell me anything. This is a rule of thumb. He won't tell me anything that I cannot find out or become knowledgeable on or informed on of my own, which means about nothing because we're in a room all the time. The adjunct of the holy of holies is what I call it. I live in the holy. I'm like the priest who can, the only person who could go into the holy of holies was the high priest. And that's what I'm like. As a matter of fact, God had me write down, just as he had David write down, a uh, new uh, Psalm 151, where God said, and it's, it's on a video. Well, God is speaking. For the Lord came to me and God said, quote, and uh, within that, he says uh, that he declared me. We actually used the psalm where he declares it for David. He declared me uh, an eternal priest in the order of Meshachedek and King David. 
and a rightful king, small k, and a rightful king. And uh, he also declared, I'm the righteous servant. I mean, that's God talking. I mean, he's using it. When he dictated it to me, it wasn't, you know, to be written in my personality. That's him. That's him doing a new song. So, uh, because he does that. He, you know, even in the writings, the person doing the writing, who, whatever prophet it was, or Moses, or uh, David, if he wrote uh, Samuel 2 and Kings and Kings 1 until he died, um, as I say, God says, look, just assume the central character is the one I had writing. Because their lives change when I come to them. Just like mine's change. You know, this is not anything I could have ever conceived or even bothered thinking of. I'd have never read the Bible my whole life. And he hadn't told me, we're going to the bookstore and get you a tonight. <laughs> that was 13 years ago. And I, my answer was, what's a tonight? I didn't know anything. And look at all this knowledge. Um, but this is it. This is the only power he's going to use in creation. He's not going to perform miracles. He's not going to have me perform miracles. And he's not. He said, the only power I'm going to use is on you. What I can get you to do. I can, he, I, he said, I can take a Gentile Texan and take him to Israel and get my temple built. <laughs> okay. He said, because that's what you say to God all the time. Okay. Yeah. And he, you know, when I, I hadn't even read Isaiah 53. He didn't come to me and just say, offer yourself a guilt. I crush you with cancer. It was me that did. That's not, I didn't, I wouldn't have known what he was talking about. We finally get to Isaiah a couple of years later. He said, keep reading Isaiah 53. I said, okay. And so I read it. I said, okay, finish it. He said, who do you think that is? I said, I have no idea. I barely read it. I ain't know what it's saying. I said, I think these two verses ought to be up here. I said, you sure nobody mess with this thing? He said, nobody mess with this. It's just that I had Isaiah to write it. He said, that's you. I said, oh, okay. And I couldn't help myself. Good luck convincing anybody. I can't even tell what it's saying. He said, before we get done, and he's right. I've been over that thing so many times. We, from my original version of Isaiah 53 that he did tell you, or told me how to put together, and, but every sentence, every word is his. Uh, we, we've changed it up and added things. I've learned things. Like, I didn't know about the test of devotion. I didn't know why the angel was leaving early in Malachi 3, but I do now. And all that would, would cause an amendment to my midrash on Isaiah 53. And, uh, you know, the book has me, these are all on videotapes now, me and Rashi. Rashi, the first one to come up with this is Israel. And, uh, you know, I look at his answers and I just shake my head sometimes. You should see his answer in Malachi 3 for the angel of the covenant that you desire. There's only a covenant of friendship and a covenant of Jeremiah. And this is his answer. He, it's midrash, so he just takes a section of the angel is on the way, and he just says the angel of the covenant. And his commentary is the angel that avenges the revenge of the covenant. I said, what does that mean? What is he talking about? God's, God's being funny. He, he said, I don't know. I said, you do know. He said, well, I'm not telling you. So, God likes to, to feel as though he's laughing. He doesn't actually laugh. He sends me a perception that he does. Or he uses me to laugh. I've mentioned that in a video. Because he can't. Well, he controls my words. I learned that in uh, uh, walking with him. Just one day, uh, I'm talking out loud as we go. We're, I'm discussing man and divine beings as though I had a sermon I was giving or a speech to somebody or a seminar. And I'm rolling, and I can tell he is really making this thing rock. He's taking it from here to here to here. And we're going, and uh, I'm going. And all of a sudden, I use uh, a word or a couple words that I simply don't use. And they're not what my mind was even thinking of. They just came out. And I just stopped. I said, did you do that? I didn't even say, hey, did you just make me say these two words? Because I knew, I knew he knew. I said, did you do that? He said, I did. He was almost indignant. I did. 
I said, okay. But anyway, that's where it all started. Now I know. But okay, guess who that is? That's the Holy Spirit using me. He doesn't sound like that. But he'll use words like that. See, he's getting bored. They like to cut. I, I mean, let me just say this. This is part of God's, you know, it's not all the time. It's some of the times we, we do tend to get kind of silly in here. But, you know, they do things after a while. I'm like, you know, I, it's like, I feel like a kindergarten teacher. And I got two of those kids that you just shake your head at. She said, this is a handful. They say, nothing but throw. I always throwing around, looking for a laugh. And, and uh, the Spirit's always working in heaven, death. God laugh, as it were. Again, he doesn't actually laugh. He just, it's a perception that that's his emotion. If God has any emotions left, because worrying about other people's pain is not one of them. <laughs> it made that clear to me. I don't care about your pain. And just saying it makes you mad. He says, see, I'm drawing anger. And he do so so many times over and over. He says, this is easy because now you're going to taste the fire out of me just to start it. I said, how do y'all keep doing this? And, and one day I told him, I said, I got it. I got it. Which means it actually came from the man. I got it. I got it. You never grew up. You never got sent to your room. You never had to climb that mountain to achieve something. Put yourself out there. <laughs> Nobody's ever hooked you. He said, I said, that's what it is. You never grew up. That's what it is. Yeah, I'm dealing with the child guy. That's what I'm dealing with. That was my argument. Then he came down as mean, very serious, mature guy. And I didn't bring that argument up anymore. But that's how it gets with me sometimes. It's an incredible lie. For, for me, without, I'm not going to get to him. I guess I'm at the end. I'm getting close to when I got shot. I thought that was a new chip. Oh, it's not. Well, I'm gonna pick this is getting long. I mean, anything over half an hour we try to stop. Now my Isaiah 53 is five hours. But uh, yeah, you know, I should watch it all at one time of course. He doesn't hardly let me watch it. Yeah, I don't even watch it before they get posted. He said, no, nah, no, nah, nah, he watch it later, because it comes on the TV that he got me. And I didn't know at the time it was going to be, you know, that he was serious about doing videos, and I certainly didn't know about making it a backdrop. Uh, he, he decides everything. You know, he tells me when to eat, when to get up. I don't sleep hardly at all, two or three night, hours a, a night, and, and sometimes less, and take, take a half hour, hour nap sometimes. But I found that and I feel fresh, you know, I don't need that much sleep. He said, well, you're not really doing anything. Why do you need a lot of sleep? And see, that used to make me mad now. I'm just laughing at it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'll pick this back up on another video. And eventually, I'll put these first six chapters just like I did Isaiah 53. Because it's a book that he dictated to me. I can't get it published. I'm going to put it on YouTube. That's why I'm reading it. And as I said, if you don't want to listen to it, don't listen to it. But uh, the information that's in these books and in those videos, is uh, it, that's my proof. And quite frankly, God says, if that's not enough for them, well, that's just too bad. Other destruction is what they end up getting. They better learn how to listen to the prophet. See, it's no different than the people back then. Y'all say, well, why didn't they listen to Isaiah? Why, or why didn't they listen to Ezekiel? Why didn't they? They laughed at Ezekiel. That's what Rashi says in his commentary. I didn't know it was laughing at him. But you see, no one. Yeah, everybody thinks they know. And but in any event, uh, I do know there, there's there's one chapter we haven't put in there, and that is um, recognizing a prophet in the town. It says uh, Moses vouched for Joshua so he didn't have to be tested. Now, the problem with all that is, and I think why God had not put it on video, is that they're looking for a seer, somebody who can see the future. But see, that's antiquity. I mean, that's not what you're looking for today. Moses wasn't a seer. 
And uh, none of the prophets were seers. They just wrote down what God told them to write down. God's the prophet. Uh, he's the one making prophecy. <clears throat> and, and what he does, he doesn't actually just, quote, see the future. He walks it through. He says, okay, right, right here is when they're going to send up a satellite. This is where humanity will be at that time. He can walk it through in his mind. As I mentioned, his eyes, he doesn't have them. It's just his absolute knowledge of all things. He can form a picture of this brain. Me, it's in here. He knows every atom of my body. And he just, it's like he does a vision for himself, a visualization. That's what I call when they put pictures in my mind. He says, uh, and he puts it into the spirit's mind. And they're both within me. You know, the big cloud that just came down. If, it, if you're sitting in a room with me, it envelops you. But it engulfs me, it goes through me. My little spirit cloud becomes part of the big cloud. That's why God is in his spirit. Here's the elements of spirit. Here's the elements of God's presence, his mind. Two clouds, they just come together. They can be together. Okay, but God's still one. He created the other cloud. And then, and then in this room, filled with them, it, my little spirit is like a little cloud that just came in and part of it. That's, that's who I am. That's a man in divine days. Okay? No, it, it's like nobody's really expecting it. Well, maybe it's because you didn't know these things. And now they want, they, you know, I get the feeling shunned. So that means I'm not looking at that. It's not like a coop. We, we, by faith, by the, by the fundamental principles of the fan band from yeah, the town, from his uh, diagnosis of the town, why don't you do your own? Why don't you throw the talent out and learn some new stuff? Why don't you get out of antiquity? Every religion has an end times like that. Every religion ends up with utopia for its people. Everybody. Well, don't be like everybody. You're the Jews. Throw it out. Let's get practical. Let's have God in our midst again, in that man like he was in Moses. Let's point at him and tell the Christians that is the man of Isaiah 53. Here's what it's about. God said he's coming back. He, he told us, we're not waiting on him like you. And he said when he was coming back, he false prophesied five times. He ain't coming back. He wasn't who he thought he was. He told us on the cross. I'm not the man of Isaiah 53. He tells us. Well, what else was he doing? <laughs> oh, why did you say me? I'm about to die. What do you think he's talking about? What do you think he's thinking about? You're not supposed to die. He thinks he's the man of Isaiah 53. So do they. It's just mind-boggling because I'm the man. And there's nothing about me that says Jesus Christ. Nothing. You should hear me cuss God. I cuss him trying to die. I beg for death a thousand times. He says, it's not been a thousand times. I said, it's been hundreds. He said, well, that's true. You have cursed me more than any man in the history of mankind. He said, and you did it face to face. And I said, you shouldn't make me so mad. <laughs> he laughs, y'all. He laughs. He, but I'm cussing him. <laughs> he did make some money. And they, oh, you're kidding. That's the story. He gave me his perspective. This is how he did it. He said, Keith, imagine you created ants. And ants are living beings. In other words, they can think and they have emotion. Okay, you get a great big ant farm over here in the room. Okay, you decide you're going to get one ant to get all the other ants to do stuff. So. But you got to get him ready. And you get him ready the way I'm getting you ready. Now, he's mad at you. Right? I said, yes. Yes. And he said, now, magic. I'm always, always laying in this bed, I've got a big table, it's got a microwave on, I put my computer on, I got a big fan I like to have on. And uh, he said, look over at that table. Now imagine that ant got loose. And he is crawled up and he is standing on the corner of that table and he is giving you the what for in ant language. I mean, he's going. And he's turning around and shaking his butt at you and he's cussing and all this. And all you gotta do is go bump and he's gone. I said, that's funny. And, and it is. And that's, that's how he, you know, that's what it does to him with me. You know, the spirit will me up. And I call him a troublemaker. Trouble. He's so funny. But um, God's so humorous. There's a difference in their humor. Okay, that wraps up. I'm told that does wrap it up. I'm going to pick up a gunshot. Uh, it's. It's, I guess it was forcing the, the accent to my knee. Uh, you know, they ended up opening me up from between my breast and my pelvic bone, and now it's been three times. 
and eventually, you know, the lung cancer and colon cancer and skin cancer. And, but the lung cancer is when they, they told you, you should have died from the colon cancer. He said, but uh, this is it. Yeah, we can't treat that. It's too advanced. You're gone. And I'm prepared to die. Uh, that was 20 years ago when the planes hit New York. It was the planes hitting New York that got me up off the ground one last time to see one more doctor. The life of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, chapter 3, gunshot. Shortly after I recovered from my knee injury, I moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. <clears throat> I was not happy about it at all. It turned out to be a lot of fun. I made some great friends and celebrated my 13th birthday. My only injury in Florida was having my front teeth shattered and knocked out requiring cats, which was more of an ordeal than I would have imagined. We returned to West University in Houston after two years. My mom was not doing well at all, and it was getting close to her second suicide attempt. I was back with my old friends and did not have much supervision from home, and I failed ninth grade. I made my own decisions, and I rarely listened to others. After being set back a year at junior high school, I made a few new friends, which led to my next serious injury. My best friend was a Spanish-Italian whose father was from Sicily, and he uh, kept a machine gun in a violin case in his office at the restaurant he owned where his son and I were waiters. It was called the Godfuck. My son was the best pool player I've ever known or played with, an absolute natural. I will call him Antonio, but that's not his real name. Antonio's girlfriend was a Jewish girl. I will call her Rebecca, but that is not her real name. Antonio was a Catholic Christian. <clears throat> Rebecca did not practice Judaism, and Antonio did not go to church. I was a confirmed atheist, and we never talked about God or Jesus. Rebecca's father had, a, had foreclosed on a ranch about eight hours from Houston outside of LaGrange, Texas, Fayette County. LaGrange was famous for the chicken ranch, which was an illegal brothel that operated from 1905 until 1973. The business served as the basis for the 1973 ZZ Top song, LaGrange, and the Broadway musical, The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, as well as its 1982 film adaptation. T.J. Forney was known as the meanest sheriff in Texas. In the coming weeks, I would be interrogated by him outside of Shock Room 3 at Bentive Hospital in Houston. This is an excerpt about him from an internet article. It was the most one-sided Texas battle since the Alamo, as 100 citizens watched disbelievingly in the dusty little town of LaGrange, their beefy sheriff, T.J. Forney, reached into a black 1975 Continental Mark IV and began to shake by his $300 suit, Marvin Zindler, the star consumer crusader of Houston, Texas. That's from People, uh, June 17th. Next, the sheriff tore off Zindler's blue-white toupee, waved it in the air, and then finally ground the rug under his cowboy boots. Behind Florney's fury was the fact that on Zimmer's last assignment in LaGrange 18 months before, he had filmed an expose, which resulted in the closing of a critical part of the local economy, the Chicken Ranch, a legendary body house. Antonio, Rebecca, and I first went up to the ranch in the summer of 1975. It was a small ranch house and small lakes with horses roaming around loose in pastures. We decided it'd be fun to try and catch one of those horses and go riding. 
The next time they went to a ranch house was in Rebecca's father's Mercedes Benz. Two door. Two door convertible Mercedes Benz. I sat on the hood of that Benz with a lariat while she tore through fields trying to run down a horse for me to rope. The horses could turn too fast, and we never got close enough for me to rope one. What we could and did do on the next trip was bring guns. A 30-30 rifle, shotgun, and two 22 caliber pistols with holsters. As a backdrop, Antonio and Rebecca had broken up as boyfriend and girlfriend, and her attention had turned to me. I did not believe that caused any friction between Antonio and me, but it should have. It did not seem to be a source of animosity of Antonio towards me in any event. On October 5, 1975, we were all back at the ranch having a great time. Tony and I were shooting at cans with our pistols and practicing a quick draw from the holsters. We were standing shoulder to shoulder about three feet apart. And he was a little forward of me. Rebecca came up behind us, between us, and said she wanted to shoot. Antonio passed his gun to her, and it fired when it was going by me. The bullet went on a straight line through my bladder, intestines, and colon from the front right and lodged in the back of my left buttock in my backside. I could see the trajectory in my mind. I fell to the ground, and Antonio fell on top of me, rolling me over and over. I think he was looking for an exit of the bullet. I told him to get me to a car and get to a hospital. It felt like Babe Ruth had swung a back up between my legs. I never once thought of God. On a big ranch, there are several gates for different sections of land and different purposes, usually with chains and a lock. When we got to the first one, I told Antonio, drive through it. I told him to ram it. I knew I was dying, and all I could think of was, you have got to hurry. I didn't panic, but I had never been so afraid and had never felt fear like that again to this day. Sometimes I think I have forgiven Antonio for accidentally shooting me, but I had not and cannot forgive him for stopping at those gates. I'm still mad about it. I was seriously angry at him. We got to the LaGrange Hospital before noon on a Sunday. They had to call the doctor to come in. I asked the nurse for something for pain, and she told me, my vital signs were too low. That if she gave me a shot of morphine, I'd drop dead right there. It would kill me. No pain medication. <clears throat> the doctor came and looked at me and said there was nothing they could do there. He told me they were getting an ambulance to take me to Houston, in Top Hospital, where they operated on gunshot victims all weekend long and, and do to this day. It's a, it's a trauma hospital. Many young doctors from Baylor University, all around the state, um, it, it's, it's the high desirable place to be because you're cutting all, if you want to be a surgeon, you're cutting all day long. I knew one thing with a certainty. I could not pass out or fall asleep. If I did, I would not come back. In an ambulance, I talked and talked to two fellas that were tending to me, as much as anything, to stay awake. I asked them such thing as what was like to be married, graduate high school, have a career job, but my mind repeated over and over, you have got to hurry. We arrived at dusk. This happened before noon when I got shot, so now it's getting dark. When the ambulance opened, my brother jumped in <laughs> to help. My mom was standing by the entrance to the shock rooms in her fur coat. She later told me that since Ben Todd was a public hospital, it might help if they thought we had money. I didn't see my dad, but my sister told me later the whole way to the hospital, all he could say was, to God, please don't take my boy from me. I had stayed awake for some six to eight hours in awful pain. 
they took me to shop room three. It was filled with people giving orders and very loud. On the table, the nurse told me she had to put her finger in my bottom, which embarrassed me. And I raised up like a sit up and saw nothing but blood rushing from my, <clears throat> from my uh, bottom onto the table. You have to hurry is all I can say. They finished prepping me for surgery and rolled me to a hall in a line of others awaiting surgery. And someone was saying my name, and I opened in to see T.J. Forney, <laughs> Sheriff of the Grange. He wanted to know if I'd been shot intentionally, what we were doing at that ranch, did we have permission to be there, and et cetera, et cetera. I told him I thought it was an accident, and to leave me alone. I never saw him again. I didn't have to wait long. The orderlies bypassed everyone in front of me and took me to surgery. I awoke in a large room with about 10 beds on my side of the room and 10 beds on the other with other patients and I could hear moaning and crying here and there. It took a few moments to remember what had happened and why I was in there. I fell back asleep and when I awoke, my dad was telling me he would head me out of there into a private hospital as soon as possible. It was the next day when they transferred me to the Methodist Hospital in the medical center where they had operated on my knee, and I had spent weeks there. I had a, a hose with a bag coming from my bladder and a colostomy, an opening called the stoma, which is your intestine on the outside of your abdomen, with a bag over it for going to the bathroom. I was out of danger from dying, but still very weak, and I needed to gain some weight. The track team was already getting together, running distance and cross-country workouts provided by the coach, preparing for track meets in the following school semester. I lived about a half mile from the high school. The day I got home, I walked to look at the track. It did not seem possible I could get back in shape. I was afraid to cross the roads to the school. I could not even trot to get out of the way if a car came my way. My insides felt like jelly, and I had been warned that too much physical exertion in the first 10 days could cause a stomal hernia in my intestine to start extending from my body. I was homeschooled for the rest of the semester by a private volunteer tutor and past classes I probably would have failed. The beauty of that gunshot was that it changed me. I was never going to graduate high school, having so, failed so many classes. So I set up night school classes for the next and my last uh, semester of high school. I was 18, soon to be 19, and a senior. Chapter 4, College and Law School. Before the summer of 1975, one of my best friends on the track team who threw the discus and shot put in field events and was a senior, told me he wanted to do something big the coming summer before starting college at Louisiana State University, LSU. I was only a junior and I had no plans for the summer. He mentioned this to me and began thinking about how long it had been since I had been to Colorado. My father, who had really good years and many so-so years, depending on how the oil and gas industry was doing. And when I was in junior high school, he had sold some prospects that completed a few wells and had purchased a condominium in Pagosa Springs near Durango, Colorado. My friend's name was Keith Miller, and I called him Miller. He had given me the name of Say Babe. <laughs> At one of our night track meets, I was running the 330-yard low hurdles, and the last turn was behind bleachers where the officials lost sight of us for a few moments. A runner two miles left veered out of his lane into mine and took my hurdle, and I had to slow down and go around it, yelling, hey, man, that's my hurdle. <laughs> I wasn't happy. I do not remember how Miller knew what I had yelled, but he was probably on the football field inside the track 
uh, working on shot putting discus, watching me run and hurt me. I did not really know him very well at this time, other than he was a popular senior, senior, who knew everyone, in stark contrast to me. On the following Monday, I was walking down the halls between classes, and coming in the other direction was Miller, though I did not see him. Then as he was passing me, in a loud voice, loud enough for everyone in the entire hall to hear, I hear, say, babe, that's my hurt. <laughs> Hence, say, babe. That began a really good and fun friendship, and I got to know the class I should have been in if I had not failed ninth grade. And because I was Miller's friend, I was immediately accepted by anyone he introduced me to. I found out about 40 years later on Facebook, uh, I looked him up and uh, we friended that uh, he's Jewish, and particularly because of his brother. He's got a, a, an older brother and uh, they look just alike, I live up in Oregon. But I did not know that. It's not something we ever talked about. It just, just, <laughs> just didn't think about it. Uh, I'm sure he wasn't observing at the time. I told Miller about my dad's condo and suggested we plan a trip up there and backpack in the Womanichi wilderness of the San Juan National Forest. I had hiked there while in junior high school with a friend and his little brother. I had a driver's license in my second year in the ninth grade. <clears throat> the prominent 13,000 foot peak is 10.7 miles from the town of Silverton which began as a silver mining camp in 1873, and that is where I plan to take Miller. So Miller and I take off, we used his car, uh, as I said, he was getting ready to graduate, and his daddy bought him uh, a Toyota, I can't remember the name right now, my dad's condo, It's about 60 miles from Durango, where a train depot is located that runs a train to the woman that she was in the facility. The train is an authentic, narrow-gauge, steam-powered, coal-fired, scenic railroad train ranked one of the top ten scenic railroads in the world. It's something else. It stops twice in the same places to let off and pick up hikers and backpackers in the Animus Canyon of the woman that she at top speed of 18 miles per hour, it takes the train three and a half hours to travel the 45 miles from Durango to Silverton. Now here it is. Miller had a new Toyota Celica. And after a day and late into the night, we made to Pagosa, slept, and we're at the train station before the first departure the next day. I don't know what the problem was, but the train was not going to run that day. So we couldn't get to where I wanted to take him. It's just too far. We decided to get a hotel in Durango and just head down the train tracks into the wilderness and explore an area I had never seen in with the maps. Uh, we got lost. And at one point we decided, we decided, let's just put these backpacks down and you go that way and I'll go this way. Well, we did that and we met back up and then we couldn't find a backpack. And uh, we did finally find them. We slept that night, and uh, we had a, a, a big black bear episode because we, we had left some food out on the ground, which we shouldn't have done. And uh, but anyway, we, we ended up making it back, and we had one of the best party nights I've ever had in my life. We hit the main street in Durango, which is a, a tourist hotspot, and... Uh, we, we hit every single bar. It, you could drink at 18 back then. It wasn't 21 as it is today. And uh, we, we, we did. We made sure. We, it was like a goal. Okay, so every one of them had at least one drink. Shot of whiskey, border maker, beer, whatever. Uh, I can't really recall other than that. I knew I had been drinking the night before when I woke up. 
But we did. We hit both sides of the street. I don't know how many, how long it took us and how many drinks we had, but it was. We just had a lot of fun. Okay, I'll be coming to chapter. Well, I guess it's four. I don't know. I thought I was coming up to the cancer story, but this is different. This is uh, getting into alterations while it's school. So anyway, I was shot on October 5, 1975, and by early December, so it was October 5, and then in early December, they put my, I had surgery again, put my intestines back together, which, which was, you know, it was dicey. They, you know, they kept telling me, we don't know, we can reattach. You know, there's people like Bob Hope lived, lived his whole life with one of these stone deals, and it's just a horrible thing. <laughs> They, they, it was successful. They got, they, they put it back together, and they removed my bladder too. The girl next door, who I had never talked to other than to say hey or hello, and who also went to high school with me, had been coming over daily, and she agreed to be my girlfriend when I asked her a few months later. I did my night school and graduated last in my class, or close to it, of over 400 people. In late December, I began running with the track team. Now I had surgery early December, and I already got out there with them, which was difficult. Uh, pulling two tires on the cinder track, you know, the rope, two tires, and you put a harness around your waist. But I had to put mine up on, high up on my shoulder. On the cinder track for a lap and a half, 660 yards for two minute intervals, six times was the toughest. My speed and quickness were still there, but distance running and my endurance, it took quite a while to come back. In early February, just about three months after being shot, I won my first 120-yard high hurdles race at a track meet that was fast enough to qualify at the upcoming district track meet for the regional track meet. Winning at the regionals would place me in state track meet. I was fast, but my disfigured right arm really held me back. Then my heart was broken, and I cried for the first time since I was a child, best I could remember. My coach, who really liked me, he understood the effort I had put in to get back in shape. Called me to his office, and I knew something was wrong. He told me I could no longer be on track team. I had too many semesters of school to be eligible according to the eligibility rules. It was because I had failed ninth grade. And of course, I had no one to blame but myself. Skipping school all the time, just not trying or caring about learning was why I failed. I was not lacking in intelligence and common sense as many people thought of me. I could and often did read a complete science fiction paperwork, paperback book during the school day. One day. I get them from my brother. I just sat in the back of each class and read my book, and the teachers always left me alone. I also was suspended from school a couple of times for five. First fight was in the gym in the bleachers with the principal on the floor telling us the do's and don'ts for the second semester of the 10th grade. This is two years before I was shot. I found out he already knew me by name, and I had never talked to him. The second fight was with the same guy, but this time we took it across the street from the school. He had about 10 of his friends, and I, being a, pretty much a loner, I had none. They were African American, bust into school from neighborhoods far away. And I just didn't understand them, or know why they even talked to me with words I did not get like word or say, man, can I hold a dollar? I know he's. That is what started the fight in the bleachers. 
I hear from behind me and one stood to my left saying, man, can I hold a quarter? I come around and just look at it. And finally said, I did not have a quarter. I wonder what the principal undid my ponytail. My kid, he's sitting right behind me, and I'm well aware of that. And I brushed my long blonde hair and then reached into my pocket for some chapstick for my lips. When I pulled my hand out with the chapstick, it turned out I did have a quarter. And from behind me, I hear, say, man, you said you don't have no quarter. To which I replied, turning around, I don't have a quarter for you. The next part is kind of hazy. But I do know I grabbed him by the front of his shirt and threw him down the bleachers onto the student sitting below me. That is when the principal yelled my name and told me to go to his office. The next day, the guy and his friends were waiting on me when I got to school, and we fought across the street. The principal had told me not to get into any more fights, and this is what I got suspended for. I remember being in, uh, after my suspension, being in the men's room smoking a cigarette in a stall, and a group of African Americans came in, and they were talking about the fight. What I remember was, was hearing, that white boy went Muhammad Ali on him, my favorite fighter. I even saw the Ali Foreman fight in Kinshasa Zaire live in Amsterdam in 1974. And some of my best friends in high school were African Americans. Mostly on the track team where we could get to know one another. I still had run-ins with the general population of the African Americans, who everyone just called blacks back then. I never used the N-word and thought they would help themselves a lot if they stopped using it. Mostly, I think they were angry at being busted in from neighborhoods far away. In fairness to them, white kids did not seem to like me much either. So, yeah, I looked young, even for my young age, and with my long hair, about six to eight inches past my collar, I looked kind of girlish, and many people said that to me. One day, a friend of mine told me what it was to him. You never smile and seem to be very angry, like if someone looks at you crossways, you're going to come after them, daring them to say something, like you want to fight. My next suspension for fighting began in Middle Shop, and it was all my fault. It is not a big deal to that. The last fight I was ever in came right before I was gunshot at the ranch. The accident really changed me and the way I looked at life. I never got in another fight after I got shot. It took some of the fire out of me. My longtime friend from junior high school and I were at Memorial Park at night and walked down a train track that ran through the woods, away from the streets and recreation areas. We went to the center of a long railroad trestle bridge that ran over a bio to wait for a train to round the corner from either direction on a single track. When a train would round the corner, we had to run and jump off the trestle after clearing the bio. We were drinking beer. As we were sitting, we started talking about the price of gas at 44 cents a gallon in 1975. And anyway, the trains weren't running. We got up to leave. And as we're walking down the steps, he said something about my father and about how to find oil and gas. And I turned around and just hit him with everything I had, with my right arm. And I realized, what a stupid thing to do. I called him the Big Sweet. He's huge Norwegian. His hair was white and long and longer than mine. His hand was the size And uh, I, I had nowhere to run. That was a really dumb part of it. I mean, I couldn't move. I couldn't use my quickness. I couldn't box uh, as I had with the fellow across the street. <laughs> and uh, he, just, he just took one big swing. He's very athletic. Uh, coaches all want him on the high school team, but he didn't want to, uh, football team. And, uh, but anyway, he hit me just one time. That was the whole fight. And it was just two hits. My, my measly hit with my right arm. I let it fast, 
And I hit him when I wanted to hit him. Uh, but, uh, well, I say that. I didn't even think about it. But uh, he just about knocked me senseless. I mean, I saw it red. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that was it for our friendship. We just, although after I got shot, he, he and I got back together a little bit. But by that time, I had met Denise next door. And uh, I wasn't going to be going out drinking beer at the trestle anymore. It was going to get serious. And that's when I set up my night classes and everything. It was a big sweep. After the gunshot, I stopped seeing old friends, including Antonio and the Big Three, and spent all my time with Denise from next door. I knew I wanted to be someone who succeeded in life. My dad always told me when he was angry with me that with my smart mouth, I was never going to be anything but a ditch digger or a lawyer. And while he said lawyer in a, in a derogatory way, he got me to thinking, I'd like to be a trial lawyer. I had to get into college first, and the only school I wanted to go to was Texas a and University. Anyone who had ever known me would tell you that I was not even close enough to being smart enough to go to any college, much less Texas a and &M. I would tell you I had never applied myself to the task of learning. Texas a and &M denied my application. I called them and pleaded and argued and finally admission said that if I came for the summer semester of four classes and maintained a B average with no fails, they'd let me in. I did it, barely. I almost failed casually as I got a B. Just a quick quick thing on Texas A and M, because it, it relates to uh, World War II which may, always makes me think of the Holocaust and, and how many Aggies were, were involved in that. Texas A&M enrollment began on October 2nd, 1876, and admission was limited to white males, and all students were required to participate in the Corps of Cadets and receive military training. Many Aggies served in the military during World War II, with the college producing 20,229 combat troops. Of those, 14,123 Aggies served as officers, more than any other school, and more than the combined total of the United States Naval Academy and the United States Military Academy. During the war, 29 A&M graduates reached the rank of general. Texas a and is more than a great university. It's the home of the Aggie family with a long history of spirit and tradition. And I'm going to pass through all that. You can read. I, I got all this from Wikipedia. Um, oh. <laughs> like Notre Dame, it's a school full of tradition, especially notable at football games and in campus life, drinking beer at the Dixie Chicken. I had a good friend in what is now the Volunteer Corps of Cadets, and we've been shooting pool and drinking beer all night. Uh, on the weekend, and finally left sometime after midnight, I walked my friend back to the quad, the Corps Cadet Quad, a large open area where people could gather, surrounded on four sides by dorms for cadets only. And I dropped him off at his room. Before he shut the door, he looked at me, and not for the first time, said, Want to race? <laughs> He's fast. We we not race me anything. I said, yeah, of course, we were pretty much, <laughs> we've had a lot of beer. I said, yes. And he went to the end of the hall and took off at the other end of the hall. He was fast, but I was pulling away with just a few yards to go, to go and hit the wall before I could stop and busted my chin open. Blood's pouring out everywhere. People opening doors. Look, 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 that's what the little guy did, the, the, the tall guy, taller guy. I also sprained my ankle. So, these are my injuries that take me in. I also sprained an ankle so severely playing basketball with football players that I was in a cast for six weeks. Those were my only injuries in the three years of being in. 
It was the gunshot that changed me and everything in my life. I married Denise when I graduated from A&M in 79, just three years after graduating high school. I went through in three straight years uh, because I had those hours from the first summer. I just went ahead and went the next summer too. And I got out of, and the average for most A&M students is five years. But I went through in three. And of course that meant I never dropped a class, which also meant I had a low GPA, a uh, grade point average. And I didn't realize how important that was for admission to law school. I was denied admission from every school across the nation I thought I could get into. I did not know how my dad knew about South Texas College of Law in downtown Houston, but he, he made some inquiries and found out the dean was a graduate of Texas A&M. And we're known for helping each other. <laughs> we set up an appointment with the dean. I told him of my uh, rather intense home life and wayward ways and that the a and m had given me a chance to prove myself as a capable student. You know, he hemmed and on, looked around the ceiling and gave me the and gave me the same opportunity A and M had. Four summer classes, D average, no fails. I did it. I was terrible at chemistry and math, but it turns out I had good reading uh, and comprehension. It's probably from reading all those science fiction books in school. I graduated in 82, and I did great on the bar examination. Keith Ellis McCarty, attorney at law. Who would have believed it? Which reminds me of verse 1 of Isaiah 53. Who can believe what we have heard? And that's what any of my friends would say about me getting out of law school. Much less of what's happening today. You go find somebody that knew me in high school, they say, who? Oh, that can't be true. Get out of here. I know him. Forget about him. Chapter 5. 27 year headache. I'm going to pick up with that on another video. And then uh, that, that, that'll be it. Uh, some general comments. Uh, oh no, five and six. I'm not sure what six is. Yeah, 27 year headache. That uh, it's, I'll go ahead and mention God in one of these accidents. And I won't say anything about the dog who took a hard left between my legs. It's about severed <laughs> my knee, my leg. I won't mention that. Or or hitting the big Swede on the track. Unbeknownst to me, my arm just took off. I wouldn't have hit him with my right arm. <laughs> the things he is showing me. And, and, and getting gut shot. Yeah, I think I would have figured out, you know, you probably shouldn't be hanging out with this fellow anymore if you're going to be talking to his ex-girlfriend for a minute. Little things like that, he controls my perception. Little things like that in my life to make sure I am the man of Isaiah 50. So if anybody thinks I'm going to back off saying that, they're wrong. I have been through too much. My whole life is dedicated to this time, the day of the Lord. As a matter of fact, you know, what about my day? I said, what about my day? Well, he said, well, first of all, God's speaking with you and living with you. Most people say that's pretty good. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, here's, here's something he's promised me that, that he lets me uh, check out all the time. Then I'm going to put it on the screen. The Radiant GP Cycles, Shorties, Slip-Ons, Cold Startup.
27 year headache. Chapter 5 of the life of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. The same year I graduated from law school, 1982, my son Justin was born in 1985, my daughter Brooke was born. And in 1988, my youngest child and daughter, Laura, was born. I was making good money, though I expected a lot more, in my first job with a law firm that specialized in collections. I also tried my first civil case, which, while, <clears throat> while working there, which was a, a nerve-wracking event, first trial, the first day I entered the courtroom, the judge asked me if I was a law clerk. I had a very youthful appearance, though I was 28 years old, not 20, common age for a law clerk. My youthful appearance in junior high school and high school with my long, wavy, blonde hair, I usually kept in a ponytail, had way too many people tell me I looked like a girl. It is interesting, though, at least to me, not one person in my entire life has ever said anything about my disfigured none. I must have looked like a girl who would beat on you if you did. When I got mad, there was no hiding it. You could see it in my face and hear it in my words. When I was 28, Brooke was born. I tried my first civil case and the bane of my existence on earth began. A never-ending headache that I generally thought to be associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. I had terrible nightmares from my youth, but now I seem to have begun grinding my teeth, causing the temporal mandibular joint, TMJ, uh, to ache terribly during the day, and the whole side of my head, the muscular, I don't know what you call it, but under, underneath the skin of the skull, uh, was always real tight, the tightening of the muscles. Uh, it was difficult to even talk to people at some points. For 27 years I had that headache. I tried everything. Even surgery on the TMJ and another surgery where the doctor severed my upper jaw and then trisected it from my skull and spaced it to fit my lower jaw. All to know that I could not stop the nightmares and the grinding of my teeth. Mouth guards helped my teeth, but the pressure was still there. I literally feared going to sleep. I didn't, I didn't want to wake up the next day sometimes because I knew how bad I, the pain would be there again. Uh, it completely ended my dream of being a trial lawyer. So I got an associate position in an oil and gas firm and began learning how to prepare title opinions for oil and gas companies on tracts of land they plan to drill on. Basically, a title opinion is you start from sovereignty, which is when the state granted the land to someone, usually great, large tracts of land, and um, from there, you get parceled out and cut up, and uh, I'd be chasing one small tract within a, a very large one almost 200 years ago in the early 1800s and uh, I would have to create genealogical charts of airship you know for people who died without a will and they had to know who the family members were and I got very good at it and I really enjoyed it. I'd go to small uh, towns throughout Texas and uh, into their uh, courthouses where they would keep all the records of every transaction of every piece of land in the county. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's an awful lot to it. I do go into it in some detail in the book, but I'm not going to for this video. Eventually, I had my own firm. It's just me in my own office and I was doing very well though billing hours for title work is generally uh, lower than other areas of the law you know by the hour uh, but I had also been involved in multi-million dollar sales of production between oil and gas companies probated wills prepared affidavits of airship 
works with land man to fix title defects, appellate work, including arguments before justices, plea bargaining criminal cases for defendants, and uh, anything else that came my way. Then it all stopped, and once again, I was fighting for my life in 2001. This is chapter six, skin, colon, and lung cancer. Oh, just, uh, God would have me tell you, he, uh, he gave me those headaches. When he came to me, I stopped having nightmares. He provides my dreams for me now, and uh, often as a learning experience. But the grinding of the teeth, everything stopped, and, and I, I thought it was just because I wasn't having nightmares. Uh, and took away any symptoms of PTSD. Uh, for which I was uh, receiving money from an insurance company for disability, partial disability. And um, that went on for about seven years. Then one day we're out walking year seven of 13, and I had that headache. It just, he, it just came, and I just stopped. And I said, you got to be kidding. You did not give me those headaches. He said, yes, I did. It's necessary. You, you, you are considered the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. You had to suffer your entire life until, until you're suitable for my purpose. And that includes fitting every verse of Isaiah 53. At that time, I had, I had finally read it, seven years into all this. It was about year two, I think. But yeah, he did. And, you know, I ended up taking painkillers left and right. And drinking with it, as so many people do. Uh, I was able to maintain, you know, my life, my work, and everything, but uh, it was enough to put the strain on my marriage that I pretty much blamed myself for it. And I told him I did it. That's the only time I got hot. Disfigure me, um, gut shot, those things, they didn't bother me. But I said, you know, you hurt my children terribly with that because I became a bad father. I mean, I wasn't the father I could be. I mean, they love me and I love them. We don't have any serious risks. They, they're off living their lives and they're all doing great. Um, but they, if they consider themselves anything, they're Christians. And uh, although I don't think any of them are overtly uh, religious, uh, or that they, they're, in Sunday, they're in church every Sunday or anything like that. But, you know, when I started going to uh, Beth, uh, the conservative synagogue here in town, and I told them I was converting to be Jewish, they, they're pretty much just that. Just saying I would be a Jew, I guess. I, I'm not sure that I didn't believe in Jesus. It was probably more of it, God says. But uh, really haven't talked to them much at all in seven or eight years. So, but anyway, so God gave me the headaches just to make sure. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I was married to Denise for 18 years, and we divorced in 1997 for irreconcilable differences. We agreed that she maintained custody of the children. The first to leave was Justin, and he came and lived with me. Then Brooke started getting in trouble, who is as tough as she is beautiful. But her mom's very difficult to get along with. Justin was a lot like me at his age. And trouble followed him everywhere he went. Like me, he was hard to talk to, and like me, his getting out of high school was a coin flip. He's doing great. He learned the oil and gas landman business. And I helped him out as much as I could, and, and friends of mine helped him out even a lot more. And he's very successful now. Um, married, uh, no children. Laura's married, no children. She's got a great job. And um, uh, Brooke is married with two children. Two, I have two grandchildren. Long life, see his children. You, you'll see what I'm talking about, long life, when I get to lung cancer that God chose to crush me with. Something had to be done, and to make matters worse, Denise had met a man, and they were going to get married. But he didn't want Brooke. 
to be part of their new family, uh, or Justin for that matter. He, he wasn't going to go stay with them anyway. Now, I had two of the children, and she had one, but all still in her custody according to the divorce decree. So anyway, I stopped paying child support on those two, but had not gotten around to the proper revision of the divorce decree when I took Justin and Brooke with me to live on the big island, Hawaii. Laura came with us to visit for a month. This oversight on my part resulted in Denise and now her third husband filing papers in divorce court for past child support for all three children. For the time I had begun paying her one third of the original amount. I represented myself. I had one contempt of court and was locked up for a day. But I never had to pay that money. By verbal agreement, I sent Laura back exactly one month later. I could not leave her out, and I wanted her to see where her brother and sister would be living. They were also close and protective of each other, and still are to this day. And uh, she was so sad. One of the hardest and emotionally painful things I have ever done was put her on the plane back to Houston. I, I can't think of anything else. The backdrop to moving to Hawaii was my firm was in dire need of new work. Uh, but the oil and gas industry was down. It's always up and down. And my clients were not driven. A landman I knew called and said his sister in Hawaii, a brilliant eye doctor, but not a good businesswoman, needed help resolving creditor issues stemming from her new offices and equipment purchases. I told him it was a good time for me, as things were slow, and uh, who's going to turn down a free expense trip to, to uh, the Big Island Hawaii? So I went and took care of everything without charge, but of course everything was paid for. When I came back to live in Hawaii, at the urging of the doctor that I had helped, who did not like the look of an abrasion on my chest, and it had been there for years. I was examined by a friend of hers, and it was cancer. I don't remember what the doctor called it. He removed it in surgery with a six-inch diameter circular cut, and it was not malignant. I could practice in just about any area of the law, and all I had to do was pass the Hawaii bar exam, one of the toughest in the nation. While studying for the bar, my body, all at once, in a moment, told me something bad was wrong with me. I had been running, swimming, riding my bike everywhere I went, letting Justin have the car, and had been feeling good and strong. In a moment's time, I was weak and sick while grocery shopping, and there was a pain in my belly and my abdomen. I did not know it, but a large tumor in my colon had burst through my colon, and I was bleeding internally. I did not go to a doctor, uh, which I guess is my nature. That, and I did not have medical insurance. Anyone asking for help, asking anyone for help unless things were at a critical stage, such as a bullet wound, uh, was something I just, I couldn't do. I mean, there's all kinds of personality disorders. <clears throat> uh, I thought surely it would pass and decide to just give it time and bear up to the abdominal and belly pain. I continued studying and took the Hawaii bar on Oahu and Honolulu in the summer of 2001. I had lived in pain for so many years from my headache and passing the bar was so important, I just kept going day by day. Pain was getting worse, and um, but I kept exercising. It was the only time I, I didn't focus on the pain. I had always been a fast healer, and I thought in any day it would just go away. I finally could no longer take it. Brooke, it turns out, was in Houston uh, visiting with her mom, and I left Justin at our little we called it to a little green shack. It wasn't much to it. We went there very often, really, except to sleep. And went to Houston to find a doctor for diagnosis, staying at my parents' townhome, which is where I'm at now. 
I had allowed my major medical insurance to lapse using premiums for child support when things had gotten lame. I just needed someone to tell me what was wrong. I would find a way to take care of whatever the diagnosis was. Early September, I was close to dying, lying on the floor of a dingy apartment of a friend who traveled for work. I could no longer get up to even try and get medical help. And I had not told anyone how bad it had become. Then the planes hit New York. Seeing how grief-stricken so many relatives were on the news, I began to think for the first time how awful my children would feel when they found out how and where I died all alone. So I asked my father, again, it's hard for me to ask people for things, for the money to pay for a colon examination that had been suggested by a doctor at one of those clinics you find in a strip mall, the only places I could afford. The doctor who performed the colonoscopy finally found what was making me so ill and unable to eat. A malignant tumor, six to eight inches long, that had burst through my colon and I was bleeding internally. You know, I, I, I come out of anesthesia, partial anesthesia, and he's holding this picture, and there's this great big purple blob, and he says, I couldn't get the scope past this. <laughs> it's not a good way to wake up. <clears throat> to say it crushed me in my life is an understatement. The pain, the weight loss, inability to eat, all I could do was drink calorie drinks. Began about four months before the colon examination. That was four months of sheer pain. But as it turns out, I did pass the Hawaii bar exam. It was now early October 2001. The doctor told me, look, you don't have insurance. Go to Bentop Hospital. That's the hospital I went to when I got gut shot. Gunshot. I prefer gut shot. It sounds better. Yeah, man. And he gave me the picture. <laughs> the procedure showing what he could not get the scope past. He's shaking his head and saying, I, they, you, know, you should have come in this early. So I went to Ben Tom thinking I was here in 75 on October 5, dying, but I did survive. And here I am again on the first week of October 2001. I showed the pictures to the admitting nurse. Instead of him sending me to the waiting room, she just looked at me and she said, My, this is a public hospital. I mean, you can wait all day long to have a cold check. She looked at me and said, why did you wait so long? And how are you still alive? And I told her, I have no idea. She did not send me to the waiting room. They had an orderly, orderly take me immediately to a room. There they hooked me up to a morphine machine where I could hit a button at a time interval I can no longer remember and receive a small dose. I do know I never missed one. I was very depressed and my parents who waited in that line for admittance with me looked so sad and depressed. It was not one of my better days, though I finally had some pain relief. Day after day, I lay there waiting for the next test they would run. Uh, it was during this time I received notification that Denise had filed uh, papers in the divorce court to recover monies for uh, the time I was taking care of two of the children. Uh, it's also when I received notification from Hawaii that I had passed the bar exam. So, you know, Bentop Hospital, what a lifesaver. I mean, uh, young surgeons in like Baylor University, uh, the medical schools, you know, it's, it's a prime position to get your hands on uh, if you're going to be a surgeon because you're, you, you're in surgery all day long and all night long. As long as you can stand up, they're bringing people in. It's just a real hot spot in Houston and a great hospital. But it's not a place you want to stay. You really don't. My doctor would come in and be out so fast, I never knew what was going on. He did tell you my previous surgery to my abdomen, where they opened me up from stem to stern, uh, complicated removal of the tumor. On October 25, my son's birthday, he was now stuck in Hawaii. 
They cut me open again on the December. <clears throat> uh, it was about a week or so later, I was released with a schedule for chemotherapy. I returned to the dingy apartment all alone. I just stared at the television for weeks. I did, um, uh, and chemo was so depressing for those who had to go into it. A small room with big chairs for about 20 people who all looked like death, including me. Uh, everyone with an assortment of bags of chemo dripping into our arms for hours. It took about eight hours before I really got sick from it. And I had to park a long way to avoid paying for parking and drive a long way to the apartment. It was a very gloomy fall and winter. When I completed my chemo of once a week for six or nine months, more tests were scheduled. I do not remember how many months the chemo lasted. I do remember I did not finish, missing the last three sessions. At the end, I could not get out of the door without bursting into tears and just not go. It just wore me down to nothing. On the right side, it was my goal. <laughs> I had my own apartment called The Loft. It was brand new and very nice on a bio close to downtown Houston with a running trail alongside it and lots of woods near Memorial Park where I had been running a three-mile circuit for since high school. I returned to being time to follow up tests, including x-rays of my chest, and the colon cancer had not re returned then and to this day. The chest x-rays were another matter entirely. The doctor told me he had bad news and showed me the x-rays telling me the white spots I was seeing was cancer. They were everywhere. Lung sort of cancer, he said, at a stage I could not be treated with any success. My dad was with me and I asked the doctor, well, what does that mean? What? And when he said, you need to prepare for death, the look on my father's face was so sad and hurt at the same time, I'll never forget. And, that, and we've been through some tough things in this house, every house we've been in. It didn't affect me one bit. I did not feel anything. I was too beat down from the chemotherapy to care, I guess. God tells me I had a lot to do with that. In fact, I, I just didn't, I just, no matter what they said, I didn't think I was going to die. But I didn't know that. I just wasn't having that conscious thought. And God says he had a lot to do with that. <clears throat> of course, he hadn't spoken to me yet. I have never seen a doctor for cancer or any other ailment since that day. I had to get Justin home was all I thought about. But I needed money. I found an old client that needed a title pin for a drill site well. I struggled through that and got my boy back to Houston. And it was tough. I was so weak. And it had been so long since I really had done any title work. And just going to pick the work up and visiting with the client was a major to do for me. But, uh, but we got there and I got Justin home and he went to live with some childhood friends. This is now 2002 and going into 2003. I just walked all over the running trails in the three mile loop at Memorial Park and in the woods day after day. I didn't think about dying, but I did start, but I did not think about restarting my law practice either. I watched a lot of television and played video games. I watched the Tour de France for the first time and got inspiration from Lance Armstrong. I was still alive though, and the funny thing was my lungs never bothered me. I was never sick. It's because God had already removed it. After I got the news I was dying of lung cancer, he took them from me. That's what he tells me. And I've never, I don't have any symptoms. I, well, as you'll see right here, in 2005, I picked up some title work here and there and made an office out of my loft. I bought my first motorcycle, soft-tailed lowrider Harley Davidson. First time in many years I was happy. I love riding that bike. In 2006, I did some landman work for standard day wages and began dieting and running. Now, 
once again, my camera only uh, goes for 29, 59, 29 minutes and 59 seconds. And I gotta, I'm gonna back back up just a little bit. In 2006, I did some land work for standard day wages and began dieting and running. I had never been a swimmer in terms of training for it. I love the water and swimming, but I never trained with laps at different paces and various distances, mostly because I was so slow because of my right arm. I was reaching an age, though, where endurance in my running was more important than speed, and so endurance swimming was too. In Hawaii, I had seen the athletes come to Kailua Kona, where we live and where the Ironman Triathlon begins and ends. Matter of fact, my, my little green shack was just right on the route where they start. That was a fun week. And it was amazing watching the athletes train and prepare for the race. I would think to myself, a human being, the human body cannot do what they are doing. Yet they were and they did. It's just amazing. I decided to learn how to swim more efficiently and how to train for distance and endurance. Get a regular and triathlon bike and enter some tri uh, triathlons. I was still alive and finally a direction and purpose in my life. Training every day for long periods of time. It really helped with my headache and I slept better. In 2007, I signed up for the March 30, 2008 Lone Star Half Iron Triathlon in Galveston, Texas, and the October 5, 2008 Longhorn Ironman 70.3 in Austin, Texas. You cover 70.3 miles, and you got to do it under eight hours. And uh, I, I was, I did real well in the first one. Uh, as far as my time, it's seven minutes, uh, I mean seven hours and a little bit. But I barely, barely made, the, made it without disqualification in the one in Austin. And it was primarily because of the hills. It's this very hilly area in west, uh, central Texas, I guess. But, uh, but I did make it and uh, swore I'd never do another one. <laughs> but I did that after the first one, too. This is tough. Um, my insurance is still paying for my inability to work, primarily based on the headache and a diagnosis of PTSD. So I was not working and I got real serious and trained to swim the 1.2 miles in the ocean. And uh, that would be in Galveston and, and in a lake in Austin, 56 miles on the bike and a half marathon, 13.1 mile run. That's what I was able to do with a diagnosis in 2001 of lung cancer that could not even be treated, stage four. And that's just about impossible. It would take a miracle of God for that to happen because generally you're going to die within one year. They say if you get lucky with good medical treatment, you might make five years. But one year is the standard if you can make it that long. That's my proof that I offered myself to guilt for God. Because you can't, it's not something provable. All you can do is show the results of that offer. And again, guilt's an emotion. I got way too many videos and everything to get too detailed on it. But that is the proof. You know, I got the, the colon cancer 20, you know, 20 years ago when the planes hit New York. And it was 2000. Oh, that was 2009, right. Too many things go through my mind when I start thinking about those cancer years. But uh, God, uh, He removed it. He had something for me to do, but that, that's, that's verse 10. God chose to crush him with disease. And as I've mentioned, the reason He chose that is to show that I was blemished, defective, could not possibly be an offer for sacrifice because He knew what the Gentiles were going to do. They were going to put an unblemished land in there and call it their, and call the Jewish people's Bible their own, and use the laws of Leviticus, not unlike Mr. Toby the singer and his six million blemished ram sacrificed by Hitler, the righteous servant of God. <laughs> now that seems to read. He's welcome to uh, uh, 
uh, you know, respond any way he wants to do that, but it's on the video, it's in the book, uh, it's in quotes by him, it's from his midrash, from his site, and he said, share this with everybody. Everybody can take it and just share how great my knowledge is. Well, it's lacking in some areas. There ain't any question he's an intelligent man, but his reasoning capabilities, in my opinion, at least as to Isaiah 53, are severely wanting. I am that man. And um, God's going to give the Christians hell with it and with me. Just like he, you know, I just heard this for the first time on the video. When all of a sudden he had me say that Jesus announced <laughs> he, he wasn't the man of Isaiah 53 on the cross. When he said, Father, 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 why are you forsaken me? Because he's about to die. And Isaiah 53, who he thought he was, and he's not, uh, who he, he didn't fit the verses, but he thought he was, he's supposed to be exposed to death. They give him long line, so boldly he goes into the Roman uh, uh, Jerusalem and gets himself taken up. He's not worried. You know, delusional, yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, but as far as I'm concerned, he's nothing but a story. He never existed. And the story starts with the Essenes of the Red Sea Scrolls and the Teacher of Righteousness. Real quick, real quick, I'll go over that. Here's the thing. Their founder is called the Teacher of Righteousness. Okay? They were great followers of Isaiah. They had the great scroll of Isaiah. The prolific writers and copyists. They had their own gate at Jerusalem. The Essenes gate. Now the New Testament never mentions them. You got Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, but they never mention an Essene. And Jesus, quite frankly, would have been one of them. Because they embody who he is. They didn't like riches, hated sinning, they didn't like material things. They removed themselves from, from Jerusalem in the most part to those caves by the Dead Sea for that very reason. But they did have a gate. They still had people who would be there. And you know what they would do at the gates? Tell stories. That's what you do. You tell stories. And it is a great story. Here's this guy. He's connected with God. Back then they believed men were God. Caesar was a God. You know, over in Egypt, you had the same thing going on. It's common thought that men could be gods. And this story just springs up. And um, they didn't even question. They'd have gone and questioned it. I mean, they're, at the, they're, they're sitting right front and center in Jerusalem. You, you think they didn't hear? <laughs> this man walking on water, raising the dead, feeding 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. Uh... You know, turning water to wine. That alone, Rome would have said, Caesar would have said, he does what? He turns water to wine. Huh, bring him to me. Don't touch a hair on his head. You don't kill the man who turns water to wine. You send him out with your armies. Make your men happy. It's, uh, you know, there's so many ridiculous aspects to it. Most particularly, God performed a human sacrifice for the sinning, for the sinning Gentiles. He, he's left the sinning Jews for the sinning Gentiles. But he gives them, he gives them an out, these Gentiles, not his child. He gives them an out. I, I know, uh, uh, I'm going to kill my sons for you so, so that you'll be forgiven of violating my commandments and laws. If anybody knows God, and the Jews do, and I know him like nobody's business, that's not him. That's not him. I mean, he told the Jews, I'm never going to leave you, but I will punish you. Now, that's him. <laughs> that, that's him. And he'll put you to hell just to make you a better person, a better people. Uh, and he has no plans to change in that. He's not going to change the minds and the thinking of billions of people to make them, to make them love the Jew. He's just not going to do it. And, and the practicality is, he didn't create man for him to even be able to do that. Now, he could have created his humanity where he could do that. He could change the mind of everybody at the same time. But I'll tell you on this, he's been working on my mind for 13 years. It is one brutal cop bump. It's, it's a very one-on-one -on -one affair. Now, he says, now, I could just kill everybody. I mean, that's easy, isn't it? That's easy. I could just kill everyone, but... 
He said, that's not, you know, it, it's, it, it's all about this. You've got to know how to read the Bible. It, you know, it's written for antiquity first and the dark ages and then the age of enlightenment. I mean, basically he's saying you've got to go back over it. You've got to check these guys. You've got to check Ram Bam and his speech. God's going to make the world speak Hebrew. Or, yeah, they will be in the pure speech. You've got to check some of this stuff. And I read Rashi's, you know, I, I, I went to his Isaiah 53 main direction. Uh, all I can say is very unimpressed. I see what he has to say in Malachi. He didn't pick up on any of this. He didn't know what the angel of the Lord is, the angel of the covenant that you desire. He doesn't know how Moses goes by a burning bush that's not consumed. The angel of the Lord is in there and God speaks. I do. To me, it's just like, well, you just get some basic concepts and... You know, all of a sudden, and, and quite frankly, it'll open up the scripture to the Jews. They can put the town of the side for a little while. Now, we'll say this. God says, you yeah, know, if you can study it, study it. There's all kinds of great things in it. Just be real careful about what you teach from it. And it's useful for heaven. If you like, if you like to talk about talent as a scholar with other Jews who may very well be in a scroll of remembrance with you, you can meet up with them. You'll see them in the meeting places, have them over to your room. Y'all can watch the new earth being created and the new peoples of God chosen and watch the evolution of the chosen people. And humanity, the same as this one, God says, why would I change it? Why would I change it? When I did it, it was perfect. And you can tell Mr. Singer that the evolution that he's talking about where all of a sudden the world's going to love the Jews been going on for over 3,000 years and it hadn't even... And, and today, anti-Semitism is up, and David is here. It's not going to happen. Thank you very much. I will be doing, um, oh, that, was that five and six? Yeah, that was five and six. Now, the book picks up at chapter seven. It's on a video when God first speaks to me. And it's, it's very interesting. And... Um, we'll still be putting some videos out. But I've pretty much covered all the major material. Everything from Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Word, Lord, there's, there's a few more things. And it's a better read than it is a video watch. But, uh, you know, for those who like to read. But it's, it's covered very well in these videos. And uh, uh, now that I've put in the personal part in, which is to show how I fit Isaiah 53. And you see the difference in my life. Now, that's the lines of suffering. That's a life of pain. That's a life of familiar with disease. You know, they say, gee, well, he died on the cross. He, he, was, he was scourged. He was scourged and this and that. Do you know how much he suffered in his life? I mean, he's not even in the conversation as a man of suffering. He's not in the conversation. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people died horrific deaths back then and, and, and by crucifixion. It's not the only one. This is descriptive of a man and his life. So you can find him identify him. And what did he do? He never suffered and he's never sick. Ever. Until the last day of his life. He's 30 years old, he's got one day but in under his belt of pain and suffering. You know, to me, that's not, you're not even in the conversation. I mean, that's nothing. That's, that's, that's not even suffering. That's just, you have a bad death, sorry. You know, you got, you got wit first. You got, you got with, one, one gospel says the scourging was an open-handed slap to the face. Now the other three do say scourge. But then you see, and then every movie you see, he's carrying that cross. He's all whooped up and bleeding, this and that. He carries the cross in one gospel only. In the other three, it's carried for him. And then he's on the cross, and what does he do? Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And then the gospel says, one of them, and then he gave up the ghost. He gave up and died. I laid in the back of the ambulance for eight hours, doing everything I could in my power to stay alive. Just gave up the ghost. <laughs> There's another video where we make that a little bit more humorous. Anyway, thank you for listening, and um, I guess that's it. Thank you. This is a video that leads into a, a brand new 
very distinct, not heard from before, commentary on Isaiah 53, which begins actually in Isaiah 52, is comprised of seven videos I have put together in the last month or so, and I'm just putting them all together uh, with a lead-in video explaining these things and, and why it's so new, novel, and has such a different view of the scripture from that which Judaism teaches regarding a messianic era when David comes, the descendant of David, they uh, often refer to him as King Moshiach. Moshiach means the anointed one. And you'll get the idea from the title of this video real quick. God speaks to an atheist. And it began like this. The doctors who gave me one month to live from lung cancer in 2002 that developed from my colon cancer, metastasizing, would have been surprised that I was still alive, to say the least. I had stopped thinking about the lung cancer years before. The white spots in the x-rays that filled my lungs like the stars in the night did not inhibit my breathing or slow me down in any way. At this point in time, I'm training for my first triathlon, and I didn't start small. I did a half Ironman. It's 1.2 mile swim in an ocean, 55 mile bike ride, and half marathon, 13 miles. They call it the uh, 90.3. One Saturday in the fall of 2007, I was cooking lunch in my small kitchen, post-divorce, and at the stove, when God said, from just a little behind me, as though somebody was speaking to me right here. And above my right shoulder, which is this figure, wash your hands. I turned around to the sink, washed my hands, and turned back to the stove. Now understand, I've been an atheist for 50 years. I mean, I completely denied the existence of God. And then from right here, a small, quiet voice, like an account they had with Elijah at the cave, said, wash your hands. And I simply turned around and washed my hands and went back to the stove. I didn't say a word to him. I didn't even keep thinking about it. I just did it. That was it. Um, it was as though he had always been there. Just as to Adam, that's what I like in it, too, and he dictated this to me. This is from my book, uh, the book of my life that God dictated to me. It's called um, The Righteous Servant of God of Isaiah 53. No, The Life of God's Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53. And uh, he put it together. It's my, and he did it because he actually came to me as, uh, as Jeremiah would say, in the womb, but in my first year of life, uh, and like Ezekiel lit and entered me. So that part of chapter 11 of Isaiah happened well over 63 years, 62 years ago. That's when that happened. That's when Moshiach was here for all these rabbis and commentators who have been saying, he's here, he's here, no, he's here. Well, he's been here, I've been here a long time. I just wasn't prepared and hadn't, hadn't even heard his voice yet. But what he did, you know, with Jeremiah, he made sure he was a priestly, godly man and guided his life with me. It was to make sure I fit every single verse of Isaiah 53 as only I can explain it, what it's for, what it all means. And, and live a life of suffering familiar with disease. God chose to crush him with disease that he would offer himself for guilt and receive long life to see his children. That's my proof that it happened. It told me 20 years ago, we can't treat this lung cancer. It's too advanced. You're going to die. And you're going to die real soon. You need to prepare for it. And it did crush my life. I, I stopped working. I just kept waiting to die. 
And I, I, I didn't die in that. I'm trained for, at this point in 2007. I'm trained for a triathlon. I finally said, the heck with it all. And um, that's the proof. Crushed with disease, exposed to death, that's in verse 12, exposed to death, and uh, here I am, 20 years later, still going, hadn't seen a doctor since, never received any treatment, which is unheard of with, with, with uh, lung cancer. And I had colon cancer before that and I had skin cancer. I'm a man familiar with disease that God chose to crush the disease, and these uh, seven videos put together as one. Obviously, I wouldn't ask or want, and I couldn't do it <laughs> to listen to them all at one time. But I know you can mark your spots and everything. But the it was spread out in seven different videos, and I thought, well, uh, the the next video I'll do, I'll have a preamble to it and explain this. This is not fooling around. Uh, once you learn my version, which comes from God of when Moshiach comes, the day of the Lord, which is left out of the Messianic era. But if you ignore me, God says, as my role as Elijah, God says, when he does return to his temple suddenly, it's going to be with, and it's not there, it's going to be with utter destruction to the land. Okay, all this is explained, so I'm not going to keep going in detail and, and, and carry on with the, uh, uh, God first speaking to me, but it was as what Adam would have felt like. This is natural. I mean, to him, you know, having somebody speaking to him from above him, from up here, from within him, it's perfectly natural. Which, and, and he wouldn't be falling down in reverence and, and, and I'm not worthy and all that. It would just be this person's always talking to me and telling me what to do. The fact that he doesn't see him wouldn't probably enter into his mind. This, you know, that's just the natural order of the world for Adam and me, particularly today, 13 years later. Still in God's fire of refinement, preparing me, and now we're taking, we have the books, they're unpublished, Jewish publisher, Christian publisher, <laughs> I, I dare not even send it to them. Because how harsh I am on Jesus Christ, who said he was the man of Isaiah 53. And it's because of him I had to get crushed with cancer. That's what that's all about. God doesn't have to crush you to make you offer yourself for guilt. He just seized Ezekiel and put him through the fire of refinement, the anguish of it, and sent him off to be a prophet to the Assyrian Babylonian exile, of which he was one, actually. The Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel is the key to Isaiah 53. That's my background. See, God, uh, these videos, everything, the way he, where he put the angel of his presence and Holy Spirit, that Judaism doesn't recognize. A host of the Lord's host. It's in the book of Joshua, one time. He did it so they wouldn't find it. He knew what this was going to be about. These are my proofs. This is what it's all about. He set it up for me to be this controversial. Just, you just got to take the Messianic era of Judaism and toss it out the window. And you'll understand why when God has me explain it to you. He controls everything I do, think, and say. Finishing preparing lunch and ready to watch a Texas a and football game, I headed to the living room and God said, Get a napkin. I turned back to the kitchen and got a paper towel. Sitting on the couch from about the same place. Sitting on the couch with the television on and my plate in my lap, God said, Get your TV tray. I got up, set my TV tray in front of me and placed my plate on it. Began eating and watching the game. That night, I was in bed reading a book from the doorway. God said, God said, tomorrow we're going to Bed Bath and Beyond to store to buy a shower curtain, sheets, pillowcases, and shop in general for things that you need. I said, okay. 
and continue re reading my book. That's, that's God's spoke to an atheist. That's how it started. <coughs> we call it the early years now when we talk about it. It was so different from the way things are and all the same in the same breath. And I have since learned this, it was by his power upon my emotions and thoughts that his presence with me was though he had always been there. In other words, when you read in the Hebrew Bible, God calls somebody's name like little Samuel, and he says, here I am, here I am. Now there's some accounts of people falling to the ground, but uh, he, can, he, can, it's, it's a, he can put a silent knowing to you. He can put knowledge within you, your mind, where you never hear a word from him. In other words, put into your mind, the God of all creation is about to speak to you. And he doesn't have to say, stay calm. He controls emotions. He told me, Keith, I, I created emotion. And there's nothing I can't do with yours. And believe me, it's been proven to me. I'm not going to get into all that. It turned, and then it, this, this story goes on. It turns out he had been like Jeremiah from the womb when he passed by that. I've never been affiliated with any church or synagogue. I've never had any teaching from yeshiva or uh, seminary. I, throughout my life, I did not. Let's put it this way. I was the actual opposite of Jesus Christ. Actual opposite. I, I'm a sinner. You know, I mean, he took me back. He said, look. You know, because I said, well, I wasn't that bad of a sinner. It was. <laughs> he said, spill me. He would go off in vision like the story of Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> I said, I started so getting smart with him. This is us talking friend to friend. I can talk to him like he's just a buddy sometimes. There is a line I know not to cross. I said, Dad, why would you call that a sin? That's a, why is that a sin? He said, Keith, that's a sin. You lied. I said, yeah, but if I didn't lie, I was going to jail. He said, but that don't make it good. I said, well, which comes first? Going to saving yourself? Or lying? And so what? I didn't believe in you anyway. I wouldn't worry about going to hell either. He says, I didn't think about those things. He tells me, man, I didn't let you. That's why I was with you from the get-go. He wanted me to be fresh. No pre-ordained, pre-settled-in uh, thoughts and beliefs on, uh, on anything. And of course, I grew up in, in Texas for the most part, so it would have been Christianity. I didn't associate with anybody who was religious. I, I didn't even know what the term Jesus freak meant. I didn't even know that Jesus died for my sins, supposedly, in their theology. And I didn't know that there was a problem between Judaism and Christianity. Um, Jews and Christians, I didn't know that. I had plenty of Jewish friends. You know, I can't. I was in the late 60s, 70s, my formative, going into my teen years, and, you know, he treated everybody uh, as an equal. I never thought about it. Including African Americans, who, it, in, in my day, we just said blacks. I, I guess that doesn't go anymore, but um, had great friends of all kinds. Uh, my best friend, I didn't even know he was Jewish until I saw him on Facebook 40 years later. <laughs> but anyway, let me, let me jump ahead. Okay, this, this goes, this is how God commutes communicates with mankind. This is what the prophets are all about. It's not just Ezekiel, a spirit lit, uh, lit and entered into me. At that moment, God was speaking. And then he says, at that moment, a spirit entered into me, and then I could hear God's words. So he's saying, and that means God is in his spirits. And um, it's just, just imagine the presence of God is his mind, and it is composed of elements of the unseen realm that we can't understand and spirit he created and the angel of the of the spirit of the holy spirit he created but that's completely different elements his presence is different from god's presence but they're like big clouds and they can float together and be as one cloud 
Okay, that cloud is what descends upon you. They are within me and without me. If you, this audience, was in a room with me, they would envelop you all around you. You'd be in the presence of God. The difference with me in that room is that that cloud engulfs me, flows through me. It's, it's within and without me, as though there's no break because of my physical structure. My little spirit is a little cloud that also drifted in. That's what it is. And it happened with all the prophets. If they spoke God's words, he was talking to them. He was telling them, write this down. Write this down. All these 20 books or so, of the books of the prophets, Ezekiel, write this down. I set this up. Jeremiah, write this down. See, your time is coming. Well, that's the time in Malachi. It all comes together, and you'll find it in all these videos. So, and it doesn't just include Moses and the prophets, the man who wrestled with Jacob. Jacob says he wrestled with a man of divine beings. Well, you know, Judaism doesn't uh, acknowledge the Holy Spirit as the person, which is <laughs> I just, beyond belief because there's so many references that this is clearly a person, the angel of his presence. But it's just God going to a man saying, hey, wake up, I'm the God of this land. See this man over here sleep? His name's Jacob. He's got his head on a rock. Go jump on him and start wrestling. Don't worry about it. I'm going, to, I'm going to orchestrate the whole thing. You'll be fine. And the guy would have said, here I am. Let's go. That's how he does. That's, that was, and, and, and Judaism says the man in divine beings is an angel. No, you know. That'd be like saying, I'm an angel. And you wouldn't want to say that. Well, you wouldn't want to say it to me before he came to me, because that ain't even made me mad. But I had a hell of a uh, temper. Just like Moses did, and like Ezekiel did. And God knows how to knock it out of me to where you smile and laugh a lot. Because I never used to. Now, well, you got to read the book, and you'll get it. You'll get it. I'm just, you know, just like a lot of people, I've been through too much, hurt too much, suffered too much to have any thought that there's anybody upstairs, you know, who cares about me. It's just, don't, 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 don't. Don't even mention his name around me. <laughs> He's going to fight or I'm leaving for it and you'll never see me again. Now, did they? Because it just makes me angry. All that's gone, by the way. Lots of stories on that. Oh, and the Spirit speaks. He's got his own personality. He's, he's angelic. Uh, he has a, a, a very childlike voice. And uh, he has, a, he's just nothing but a, a ball of humor. <laughs> he's just, he calls it, he didn't ask me to say he's the greatest comedian of all times of the universe. And uh, he's just a joy to talk to him. And uh, he has the smarts of God, as he tells me. But uh, I have instant communication with him. I have instant communication with God. It's like there's three persons in my mind. This one cloud is, is three clouds. It's two spirits and, a, and the elements of God's mind. And um, slow process of 13 years. And it's 13 years of, and this is from Isaiah 53, punishment, wounding, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing, bruising. And I'm telling you, he's relentless. But it's in the stories, and I have a lot more once I get to Israel. And I have full confidence God's going to get it done. That's one thing I don't worry about. Thirteen years, uh, a year and a half of trying to get books published, denied uh, 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 by everybody who even bothered to answer me. Because it's just so different. And it, it can only go to Jewish publishers. And it's just like, well, this isn't the stuff we believe. And it sounds like he's saying it's him and this and that. Well, I was. God said, I made sure I didn't get them published. I wanted to do the videos first. You see, I'm not on the executive committee. I don't, I don't know what's going on 99% of the time. I don't know what I'm going to have for dinner. I no longer have self-will. I can't ask him for anything. There's all kinds of reasons for that, such as, you know, if one of my kids gets sick and he doesn't heal them up, you know, cancer or something, 
Am I going to be disappointed? Am I going to be hurt? The answer is no. He's trained me too well to even bother asking if he's going to do it, he's going to do it. I know he has the knowledge and he's right here with me. So, you know, it's a long, uh, detailed process. I know things from his perspective. Um, this is another reason the Messianic era is not going to happen. And it comes out in these films. But the Holy Spirit, the angel of his presence, uh, we can, we're friends. God says, I, I can't be friends with human beings. He, I said, well, we're friendly with each other. He said, yes, that's right. I said, uh, uh, you know, I got Googled this, and technically you are my friend. He said, well, I know, but I just don't acknowledge you. I said, why? He said, because I'm God. That's the way I am. I get to do whatever I want. Now, he's just messing with me. He's just like having a friend. Of course, it's a true statement. He can do whatever he wants. But he's pretty stately and regal. But, uh, again, we live together. I've lived with him for 13 years now. And it's never going to end until I die. I wouldn't even know what to do. Uh, and he said, if I let you, you're going to fall down dead. You're not supposed to be alive. I keep you alive. So I took that cancer from you, but I just put it back in. If you do something that makes me want to leave. I said, well, what am I going to do? No self-will. To an extent, no self-thought. And I told him, I'm not even a human being anymore. He said, well, what are you? I said, I don't know. I'm a man in divine beings, but I'm not a human. I don't have self-will. That's what distinguishes the human being from the animal. He said, but I'm being the human for you. I'm providing your self-will. So you do, in a way, have it. So you're still a human being. I said, well, I'm dead. He said, why are you dead? I said, because it's like my brain's not connected to my spirit anymore. It's like you're sending all the information in. And that's about heaven. I haven't lived the existence in heaven as to my thoughts. Because in heaven, you won't have a mind. The heaven for the Jewish people only, I might add. You won't have a mind. God's got to provide it for you. He's got to be you for you. As a completely new and different creature. It's still you. It's a very amazing story on how that does. And I'm taught all these things and literally experience them. Not only in the real, but in visions. I've had more visions than... You, if you count every single vision in the in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, I've had easily double that. And I'm a walking visual. God's communication, and this actually shows up in the story of Moses. He won't let me tell right now. But uh, he puts images in your mind. Instead of saying a sentence, you get something in your mind, a picture. Uh, anyway, I call it visuals. And you can be wide awake for those. And I can be envisioned right wide awake. Okay, so we finished our shopping. <laughs> Shower curtains and everything. And God said, let's go to the bookstore and get you a Tanakh. To which I replied, well, what's a Tanakh? <laughs> I didn't have any, I didn't, Hebrew Bible, okay. Well, I know the Holy Bible. New Testament, Old Testament, and on we go. I'm starting to learn for the first time. At Barnes and Nobles, we looked at all the Hebrew Bibles and purchased the Jewish Publication Society's Tanakh, the Holy Scriptures, which is a translation that began uh, in 1956. It was published in 85. Men who spent 30 years on the Co on the Leningrad Codex, the oldest Hebrew uh, Bible in existence. They started from scratch. I hear these rabbis and people saying, well, I know what these translations are, this and that and that and this. And, and God says, just go with the JPS. They, they hit it right just about every single time. I've only found one thing that, uh, that uh, I don't understand how they missed it. But and it's in 53. This is the 1985 edition. That's the best translation you can get out there. And I don't just hear God speak to me. His presence is heavy. And I'm also, you know, it says he uh, uh, pinned Ezekiel's arms behind his back with his cords of power. And by his cords of power, Ezekiel could not leave his house. Now, that's in Isaiah 53. He took him from, took him from the land of the living. He took him from society. You know, the man of Isaiah 53 lives, so he's taken from society. But that doesn't, from the land of the living, that doesn't mean he died. And there's no crucifixion in 53. So, 
you start to see how Ezekiel is so important in this. And uh, that's where you find out about the covenants of friendship that come with God in the day of the Lord when Moshiach comes. Again, you don't hear anything about it in this Messianic era. I, I'll tell you this. I think the Jewish people are going to like this better. I think throwing out all that rubbish Judaism has been teaching from back in antiquity, that's where they're stuck, and, uh, and see what's really going to happen with God coming back, a man in divine beings, with the capabilities of Moses, Elijah, the descendant of David, all their attributes, okay, are in me. I can be each and every one of them, and I can be all four of them at one time. And God can speak to me. So, it's going to be fun. And he wants his temple rebuilt. That's what that's, that's the purpose of Isaiah 53. It says, a purpose which might prosper of God. But he doesn't tell us what the purpose is. Well, we find it in Malachi 3. I'm sending my messenger before me to clear the way for me, and I shall return to my temple suddenly. But the covenant that comes with David says, I'm going to place my sanctuary amongst you. He already knows it's not going to be there. And then we have Elijah in Malachi 3. Well, he's got a purpose that might prosper. And if it doesn't, God comes with utter destruction to the land. And again, you don't hear it with the Messianic era. Utter destruction to the land. There's 7 million Israeli Jews. How can you not read that and go, that sounds an awful lot awful lot like, I'm going to raise up armies against you. How can you just ignore that? Well, anyway, we're getting fixed up. And, and the purpose that might prosper, I never believed that. I think they just hooks the man of the righteous servant of God of 53. I think that puts him with, he's got the same purpose as Elijah. Elijah's supposed to bring the families back together. Uh, through the laws and teachings God gave Moses that or being mindful of them. That's the new covenant. It's an amendment. Uh, it's an amendment that also has a new inclusion of sin forgiveness. Over the last 63 years, God's presence has resided in Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and Hawaii. And he is more than ready to return to his land, Israel. Because wherever I am is where his presence is, and those are all the different states I lived in over this time period. Wherever I go. And in fact, if you see me in Israel down at the old city or down at Tel Aviv, uh, you, can, you can turn to your friends and say, hey, I know where God is. <laughs> they say, really? I thought he'd have left. Some people say he died. He said, no, you see that guy over there? He's all around that guy. And some say inside too. That's what it's going to be like. God says, we get to Israel, we're never leaving again. I said, I want to see Great Britain. He said, it was like, it was like did, did you just ask for something? I was like, oh. Yeah, that's good. I hope I, I, don't, I, hope I fry if I hit the border and cross over. I hope I just burn up. Bust in a combustible flame. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's where he wants to be. And uh, I, I'm sure he's going to get there. This purpose that might prosper, again, I think it just, it just shows the purpose of the righteous servant and the purpose of Elijah. Because he knew I was going to be teaching there's only, in the day of the Lord, as you would imagine, he wants to fulfill, have all the prophecies fulfilled, be done with the prophecies. And there's only a handful, four men to come that we've never seen. Um, the descendant of David, prophet like Moses, Elijah, and of course the righteous servant. We only have one description. Even the sages knew. You gotta have a description of the descendant of David. It's Isaiah 53. They called him in the Babylonian Talmud the leper scholar. You'll see me referencing it uh, on just about every video. In other words, I'm saying, look, it's not Jesus, it's not the people of Israel is taught today. 
it's this guy from the time that just hadn't come yet. You just didn't know, didn't have a man that fit the description. Well, you do now. And two covenants. The, the friendship covenant, which is actually in two parts, Ezekiel 34 and Ezekiel 37. Uh, one part of which is I'm going to put my sanctuary amongst my people. And the other part, uh, interesting enough, has to do with the land blooming again, which is Jeremiah 31. See a time is coming. The land will bloom again. See a time is coming. The uh, cities after desolation of many years, 2,000 plus actually, will be restored in Jerusalem rebuilt. And the Jews shall never be defeated again. Okay, now we just talked about other destruction, likened to armies being raised. But here it is in this friendship covenant. In this, no, no, Jerusalem being uh, uh, rebuilt. If that's done, then you'll never be defeated again. So, you know, you look and you go, well, there's kind of a problem between those two. And what I think it means is he's going to get the temple built now that Jerusalem's been rebuilt and he's come. That this might might prosper, uh, because it, you know it kind of gets you. So what is the purpose of God might prosper? Who thought you could do everything? And he said, well, on our part, my people got to listen to you. They got, especially the rabbis. They never listen to my prophets. They're all full of themselves. Think they know everything. Boy, he starts getting angry. And see, that's not good for me, because I, all of a sudden he wants to make me better, which means suffering. You gotta keep him away from those moves. I'll tell the spirits, he's on the funny. Get the funny guy around here. We talk friend to friend too. Well anyway, I'm gonna let you there's, there's a lot more, but this story's in the in my book. Hopefully after spending time and understanding who I am. That this is here, it's happening. I, I don't care what the rabbis think or say. Look, I'm a prophet of God. I'm a man in divine things. You know. If I say something contrary to what they think and say and believe, they're wrong automatically. It's a given because God is the one telling me all these things. It's his book. They're wrong automatically. And he is livid that I'm having this problem with Isaiah 53 being the people Israel. I, well, it's in the videos, but you ever see the arguments they really put back before that for Isaiah 53, 10. And, and other verses, uh, Rabbi Tobias St. Rabbi's Judaism, he went Christian. You know, the Christians went to the, the laws of Leviticus, animal, animal sacrificial laws, and said Jesus is the unblemished lamb. That's why, and you know, they're using, you know, uh, Leviticus where you could offer a lamb and for unintentional sins, but nevertheless, they turned it into he was a human sacrifice. Which he says himself. He says, God no longer wants bulls and goats for sin. He prepares my body for sacrifice. <laughs> He's human sacrifice. And God made the sacrifice to Gentiles so they didn't have to obey his commandments and laws. You know, from an atheist who comes in with no religious background, I read that and I just... I look up face to face with God wherever he is at the moment. And I say, you got to be kidding me. People believe this? this, is, this. He said about two billion right now. <laughs> so I'm not going to bother trying to tell you how many there's been in 2,000 years. God made a human sacrifice to me so I can go to heaven and I can go kill somebody if I want to. I can go rough. I can go beat my wife and my kids. <laughs> I sent Jesus again. I was so, God was teaching me the New Testament, and uh, this guy at uh, one of these mega churches uh, came up to me and says, You know, if you do accept Jesus Christ, you're not just forgiven of all sins that you have committed, you're forgiven of every sin you're going to do in the future. I said, Really? He said, Yes, really. <laughs> he said, Jesus knows you're going to do it, and he already forgave you. I said, what? Okay. So, if you're a Christian, you can just sin all the time. Because Jesus knew you were going to do it. 
I hadn't actually heard that thought, but that's the effect. Okay. This year in Jerusalem. Enjoy the books. Uh, don't try listen to uh, the video. Don't try to watch them all one time. But what I did is I put them together for you in the order they should be. And uh, I just thought it would be easier. And we're, we're kind of coming to the end of our videotaping for a little while, it seems like. Again, I'm not on the executive committee with God and His Spirit. I never really know what we're going to do next. Um, and the books are at keithmccartymccarty.wordpress.com. You can find that on my YouTube channel. Um, 